been doing. And uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Hill. Give me a second, everybody, to uh, sync up here. your friend you're my friend there we go uh, yeah exactly uh, he's in, he's in uh, Denver right or Colorado so it's not too late everybody hear me everybody good okay my name is Andre Hill. I am uh, the CTO for Linux in uh, North America, well, actually in the Americas for uh, Novell. And I also run our Linux program office, which has a responsibility for what are we doing strategically? Where are we going? Uh, what makes sense today and what do we think makes sense to, uh, tomorrow? Not only for open source, but also for our commercial products as well, but primarily really around what are we doing with the Linux distribution, things that relate to the Linux distribution and uh, of that nature. Come on through. Not a problem. So I didn't take it. You started already. Okay. I, I just on slide one. I didn't okay. didn't do a thing. You missed a really good joke or something, but uh, I think they're still full. Yeah. He's redoing the tape, so I, I, I will wait. We will have podcasted and video streamed within about 48 hours. Not a problem. Uh, just to start over, to give you a quick overview again, my name is Andre Hill from Novell. I am uh, the CTO for Linux in the Americas and also run our program office, which has overall responsibility for really looking forward for what's directional out there and, and happening in the marketplace. What are we hearing from our customers? And then how do we implement that and how do we stay two or three steps ahead of what's happening, not only in open source, but also in the commercial proprietary world as well. So to say, what do we need to do to make Linux really enterprise ready? What do we need to do to make open source not only something that is, uh, uh, and, and what one CIO told me of a Fortune 10 company, it's, it's a niche in a knit. However, I understand that knit in a niche is turning into an itch that's getting very big. So how do we prepare, prepare for what's very big and make sure that the knit in the, in the niche really aren't painful in the meantime? So we spent a lot of time talking about where is open source, where is Linux, and how do you really make it enterprise ready? How do you, do you, do you prepare for the huge expansion that I think that we all know is coming? So in doing so, let's quickly give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and let's make this as interactive as possible. If you, if you feel so that you want to stop me, uh, not a problem. So I want to give you an overview, state of the state, what's happening. Really show you two continuums, one about what we call our, our open source continuum, where we believe open source came from, where we think it's going, and what the steps are to get there. Talk about uh, some emerging markets, current state. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of interest out there on, on open source, but to really talk about the customers that are running it, and I'm talking enterprise-wide customers now, the Deutsche Banks, uh, Deutsche Bonds, uh, Lehman Brothers, the, more, the, the biggest of the big customers, what are they actually doing with it, and where is it actually used today? Specifically Linux and then open source, because there's a lot of times with those customers that you see things that are consistent, but there's a lot of divergence in certain areas as well. And then we're going to talk about the growth, and we've come with really four key areas that, uh, that we think that are necessary to spurn the growth, uh, to spur the growth of open source and Linux uh, across the environment. And that's really fostering enterprise class support for distribution channels, making sure that we do key innovation with open source and we're not just copying things that are out there, that, that we're truly doing innovation with open source and using that, the community model to that effect. Um, that we have mixed source as well, something that may be controversial with this group, but we, we believe and we've heard from our customers that Open source is more ready to be adopted and is more readily adopted when integrated with some commercial and proprietary technologies that are in place today. 
And again, I'm talking the data centers of, of customers' environments that are running 5,000, 6,000, in some cases 10,000 servers, uh, and make changes to all those times. A lot of times they have infrastructures in place, and they're not going to do a rip and replace, whether it's for another commercial product or whether it's for open source. So we've got a mixed source strategy, and I'll talk about that today, and also data center. We believe that, for again, for, for Linux and for open source to really make a key play, we really have to spend some time going to areas that traditionally people don't think about Linux and open source. To do that, we've got to be able to meet service level agreements. We've got to be able to put out a hardened product and things of that nature. So that's really where we're going. I'm going to go through a couple of these real quick that really aren't that important, but let me get to, uh, I, I will tell you that there's some quote unquote marketing slides that uh, one of my marketing guys put in here. And, Whenever you see that, you, won't, you probably won't see it on, on, the, on the screen for very long. Uh, it's the ones that have a lot of pretty colors and arrows going left and right, up and down, and maybe some pictures that don't relate to anything else. But I call those my marketing slides. And I, he spent a lot of time putting them together, so I, I, I included them. But I didn't promise I would talk to them. OK, so open source continuum. Where do we start and where are we? Again, this is a very high level view of the world. But if you look at it, we started from an open source perspective. In terms of, and again, I'm talking about the, the adoption of really at corporate enterprises, the entities that are really probably going to fund this going forward. Um, I, I often talk to people about uh, uh, my experiences at Linux World, and I said, you know, when I first started going to Linux World, before this job, I used to run um, uh, Linux and open source and, and a lot of strategic directions for Dell. Uh, and a lot of time, when, you know, we had a, a laptop offering five, six years ago, and uh, I think at that time we sold 10. Um, we sold 10. And, and literally, you know, that's not something that Michael's very uh, impressed with. So he said, I think you need to find something else to do for the next two or three years. And then we, we brought that back around. But I, I always tell the story that when I first went to Linux World, uh, it was actually in a, in a, it wasn't even in the Moscone Center in, our, in, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. It was in a smaller section. And it was probably, I, I tell the percentage of people that had, that had black shirts that had hacker on them and then the suits and ties. And that percentage has, has the hackers have gone down drastically over the last years, and the suits and ties come up. That's good and that's bad. As, as you were saying earlier, and, and I heard part of your previous presentation about when corporate gets in there, well, there's a lot of things that may or, not, may or may not be best for the community or may not be best features and functions. But guess what? Corporate's got a lot of money. And corporate can spurn a lot of things that they couldn't do before. A lot of things behind Apache, if IBM wasn't there, a lot of things probably wouldn't have happened. A lot of things around clustered file systems, if Novell wasn't there or if uh, Red Hat wasn't there, putting a lot of money in there, if Dell wasn't there, um, some of these things wouldn't have happened. So I, I think it's, a, it's a, probably a necessary evil to get a lot of suits and ties uh, to come to the Linux world and understand what's happening with the open source community. But really what happened when we, when we first started off, when we first started seeing acceptability of open source, it was part of an appliance. The open source was probably hidden underneath some hardware, underneath some functionality that was provided in a, in a data center, used as a network edge. Maybe it was a, a uh, some type of router or something where open source was embedded inside of that. And really the focus from a customer perspective is I didn't see open source. I didn't even think about it. I didn't even know what it was. I was focusing on what my appliance did. So I was focusing on the hardware functionality. Taking that over, going from your left to right, um, open source as a viable infrastructure platform. This is really when we started talking about the, the, the lower TCO that open source and I remember at, at Dell going and talking to a CIO of, a, of a, the number one um, insurance company in the United States. And he actually said, you know, open source has given me a lot of TCO. And then one of his lieutenants said, no, well, open source really hasn't provided you anything in terms of TCO. He, he said, you made all your money from changing out your hardware. He said, you know, it's operating system's operating system. In fact, it's probably about the same cost we're buying it from at that point Red Hat or buying something from, from Microsoft at the scale that we buy. And he sat and he thought about it, and he said, you're, you're exactly right. Open source really hasn't provided me open source itself. He says, but it enabled me to do something. It enabled me an openness to go to a different hardware platform to get that TCO. So the focus there really wasn't, again, on open source, on innovations. It was on how do I get back more money? And that's what happened on Wall Street, and that's where the pull really came from, from the corporate America and the funding. And then it got into to what I call the, the middle America corporate market. But it's really a price performance focus. How do I significantly reduce my cost? And I'm going to use any tool, and I fully believe that if there was a commercial product out there, they would have used a commercial product. It was basically a focus to get to Intel and get off of higher priced hardware. Open source happened to be that tool. It's not a negative. It's not a positive. It's, it's basically 
the view that these, that these corporate customers had. And then we got to the point where, where we started to say, you know, open source, yeah, you know what, I, I can probably run this to run some, some J2E apps. It's, it's good enough. I was talking to um, uh, a very large credit card provider who has the largest um, installation of WebSphere in the world. And they said, you know what, we really like WebSphere, we're going to WAS5, we're going to 5.5, we think things are great. Then it came back to me a little bit while later after having seen uh, some JBoss and, and running some performance tests on JBoss and running their applications. And they said, well, JBoss doesn't give me everything that it, do that it does, but it's good enough. It allows me to run my applications. It allows me to run probably 80% of my applications without having to do anything to them. The Java is Java is Java makes sense. And you know what? I get a lot more flexibility, and I get a little, little nudge that I can give my friends uh, at, at IBM. It gives me more flexibility. So again, it really wasn't the functionality that they were looking at. It was what does it provide? What are the options it gives them? And really, that's a trend that we've seen with open source. I think we're getting to phase four right now where we're starting to see that now we're getting where, where the gaps between open source software and commercial software are getting quite thin. We're starting to see some, some customers where I had one customer tell me that, yes, we use Linux in this area, we use this in that area, but the best case fit for us, the best case fit for, for us happens to be open source. In their case, it was, a, it was a, a LAMP stack. We think that for this application environment, the best case fit functionally is open source. And that's not something that you could have said probably two, three years ago. That's been a maturity of functionality. And that's really the first time that we started to look at really a focus on functionality. A focus on functionality as opposed to what else it's giving me in my environment. Also from an open source, I think we're, we're, we're getting to the stage, the Nirvana is to get to the, what I have up here as phase five, which is proliferation across every part of a corporate environment, every part of an of a, uh, educational environment, but really also in every software environment. So we're not just focusing on high-performance computing. We're not just focusing on, on an application server. We're really talking about maybe what a sugar CRM is trying to do with an enterprise resource planning system, the bet your business, the jewels of an organization. We're not there yet, but that's where I think we need to go. Now, what that also brings in, I think that does, it kind of turns the tables a little bit. Instead of us focusing and customers focusing on what, uh, what open source does else for them, once we get to that point, they'll start to do something for the open source community, which is they'll start to fund these third-party tools, which are really the part and parcel of any operating system or any environment really taking hold, is once you have all these third-party tools in a third-party community that's out there building enterprise class-ready software. That's when I think the open source uh, uh, train is really going to start, it's, it's, it's going now full speed, but that's when we're going to get supersonic, maybe get some of those light speed trains that they have over in, in, uh, in Japan. Now, if I had to say where are we today, I would probably put out there and say we're probably about right here. We're, we're, we're just starting phase four, um, where we're getting to the point where we're seeing a lot of mission-critical software, uh, mission-critical mission workloads. Again, moving away from the network edge, spurned a little bit by people doing some things with MySQL and the clustering, and high availability, being able to meet service levels, but we're not fully there yet. Now, let's take a case study and talk about, with that continuum, let's look at one open source project, in this case happened to be Linux, and what's happened with that, and where is it today, and what's going on. Now, probably everybody's seen this chart in, in various forms of IDC, and, and, and it looks at, uh, you know, an estimation for 2000, I think I first saw this chart, and it had an estimated view of what, what it was going to look like in 2002, 2003, 2004. This one, I, I think I pulled from last year, is 2005. And every year, that estimate's been wrong. Every year, the open source and Linux has grown faster than what the projections have been, no matter what the projections were. It's always grown faster. Windows, is, as you see, it's pretty much pretty, pretty flat once you get from 2001 on to 2008. It's pretty flat. It's probably always going to be pretty flat. Um, you see that uh, Unix, uh, a lot of people like to say, well, that's an asymptotic curve. Realistically, it's probably pretty flat as well. What we're seeing is that the new growth areas are in Linux. Where, yes, there's migration from uh, a Solaris, so there's migration from an AIX or from an HPUX down to, to, uh, to an open source or to a Linux. But really, it's the net new areas that we're starting to see. And that's what, what this chart really tells us, is that people are, are, are replacing new environments uh, with open source. They're keeping. I, I'm, I'm not one of those people that believes that Unix is ever going to die. I believe that Linux is a variant of Unix and that people, I've, I've talked to every customer, and, and not one has ever told me they've been dissatisfied with Unix. Not one has ever told me that. They're dissatisfied with the cost, 
Going back to that phase two again, they're dissatisfied with being locked into a particular strategy. They're dissatisfied with, with having their management tools and everything else automatically geared for them once they pick a, a, a solution. But the functionality, they're fine with. Let's be honest, operating systems are a necessary evil. You, you really don't buy something. You, you're not running your environment saying, and you walk in, what operating system you're running? No, it's what applications, what are you running in your environment, what are things happening? But that really lends us to this chart which says, the net new environments, people are saying, I want more choice, I want more flexibility, and I'm now starting to, to get into certain areas that I wasn't in before. Now, where are people running it? Well, if you look at the chart, uh, again, on your right, it talks about where are we today in 2005. Realistically, we're, it's a $4 billion market in terms of, of, of people running Linux in this environment. It's a $4 billion market. And it's like, these numbers are actually a little bit lower. Uh, the numbers that we just did when we, when we closed our books last year came out to about a $6 billion overall market of people running software on the Linux environment. However, if you look at it, where are people running it? Well, it's pretty much still in that big red block, which is the network edge, file, print, web, email. Yeah, there's some people who are starting to do mission-critical apps, and that's a lot of it was spurned by Oracle uh, getting together and doing some things with Rack and, and starting their development first on Rack and doing their internal data centers on, on, on Linux as well. Um, it got with Dell right now internally at Dell. Dell runs their entire IT environment on Nobel Linux. Um, Red Hat runs, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Oracle runs uh, part of their internal development center on Red Hat. They run their hosting center where they're better business on Linux. Um, they're still doing some development on, on, uh, on Unix. But there's a lot of things happening, and I think that started to spur the, the growth to mission critical. However, if I was to show you the same chart for Unix, it would probably be a flip-flop. I get to the point where I'd see a lot more mission critical, a lot more better business, a lot more data center applications that are running there, and probably less of the network edge. That said, let's discuss why that is, and that's really going to be the thesis of what we're talking about is what is really the reason that we're not into that network edge and what do we need to do? Now, we asked some customers this with IDC last year and said, what are the reasons that you adopted Linux? And the majority of them, you can take the bottom two, and it's really TCO, replacing Unix again, Again, not replacing it just to get rid of Unix. It's for I want costs back in my environment. I want to get back those costs. And the consolidation. And we know server consolidation is basically another way of saying that I want less boxes doing more things, which, again, gets to the bottom line. Um, they, they, they don't know any others. I'm not sure I would want to work for those customers or they no longer need Unix. But they, that was their responses, and, and I'll take them as, as, as they were. And what's interesting is you see, see the difference really from the different um, uh, verticals here. Financial services, which again, I remember sitting on Wall Street uh, probably four or five years ago and actually planning out a deployment and management system, which to this date has not come to fruition from a commercial standpoint, but they've built it from an open source, one of the, one of the vendors, because again, they had significant price, price problems. I went in there and the CIO said, I've got to take out $200 million this year. I said, I have no idea what you're going to do. And he showed and said, this hardware is a good portion of it. I'm going to have to do some consolidation, but I've got to take that out this year. So they spent a lot of money in allowing them to save a lot of money. And I think that's why you see the, the larger trend there of replacing Unix in, in the financial services market. Uh, final, final last chart here. Uh, what's really the top workloads? Again, if you look at this again, it really gets down to, as we said earlier, the uh, web infrastructure, the application uh, server, that's probably about a third of this, if not two-thirds. And then we get to database, and that's, again, the MySQL Oracle explosion that's happened over the last year and a half. You don't really see the business process applications. You don't really see the decision support. You don't really see the, the CIO-level mission-critical things yet. Doesn't mean they're not coming. They're just not there yet. Now, also in Linux, we're seeing significant growth in, in emerging markets. Um, Novell spent a lot of time and money investing in, into the China market and with significant results happening. We are now, well, well, it is now our second fastest growing Linux market in the world. Um, significant growth in China. Significant growth has happened in China. We've established a new resource center, research and development. We're doing a lot of internationalization, localization, which was the primary issue and the primary problem with doing business in China and, and some of the double byte countries. But we've got now a high-performance Linux, significant presence for carrier grade with the telecom industry and what they're doing over there, significant need for, for carrier grade. And we also set up a, a, a consortium with the uh, C, CS2C. I always get that wrong. Um, it seems like it should be C2SC. Um, the China Standard Software Company to actually do a couple different things. We're doing carrier grade Linux with them. 
But we're also opening up, I guess I should start, shut down my uh, instant messengers. Uh, we're also opening up um, what we call OpenSUSE.org. And when OpenSUSE.org, specifically a China version, is that we're allowing Chinese developers to actually build in the localization and build in their own version of OpenSUSE, which is, again, if you guys are familiar with Fedora, which is our, our version of Fedora, which is our, 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 our uh, daily release type of site, OpenSUSE.org. And we're, we're uh, encouraging and actually spending money to build an open source community in China. Uh, it's been significant success. Uh, I, I would say that probably now, if, if you go to the Chinese version of what we've put together, Solution Forge, there's probably about 10,000 projects that are out there. Uh, and that, some of these are very small, and some of these are probably duplications, but that's from a, a number of, of less than 20, uh, probably uh, 18 months ago. So I think similar to what people are seeing in other markets, uh, the, the, the Chinese market is, once seeded properly, significant market, significant market opportunity. Now, higher education has always been a significant play that we've done in, in higher education. Again, high-performance computing clusters. Look at the top 100 HPCs that are out there. I think it's about 78 or 80, if not more, are running on open source, or running on some variant of Linux. Um, we also have something called the one-to-one -one initiative that's happening at the Indiana Department of Education. It's kind of a four-headed beast here, which is the Indiana DOE, Novell, Intel, and Dell have come together with the plan. Indiana had a vision of providing a computer for up to one million of their students in grades 6 to 12 over the next three years. They want them all to have a computer, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a desktop, and they've decided to go open source to do this. So we're in the process now of actually, with Dell, giving all these uh, uh, schools, and right now I think we're in 11 to 12 schools doing a pilot, providing all of them with an open source version of, of our desktop, Nobel Linux desktop, and that Linux desktop is going to be what these people interact with. Now, why is that important to the open source community? Well, obviously, the next step of that is that we're actually fitting that with open source tools on top of that. So they're all going to be using open office. They're all going to be using other open source tools going forward. And we're starting up in the high school areas some development platforms that they're going to be using as well. This is, I think, something that, that you're going to see a, a lot of other states looking at. We've got probably five or six other states that are looking at this saying, hey, the price point makes sense for us. We know this is something that we need to do. Uh, does it make sense for us to follow what Indiana's doing with one-to-one? -one? Not fully done yet, but again, it's, it's over the next three years, and we think we're, we're, we're looking at over a million people. So the summary is that there's a lot of things that are going on there, and you know, there's more than three million servers in, available and in, in use today around the world in Linux, 100,000 projects on, on Solution Forge. I would say it's higher than this. I'd say it's probably around 65 percent of CIOs are adopting open source as a major platform, which is a different from saying just they're adopting it. I think everybody's probably got open source. Probably 90 percent of the customers have open source in their environment, but a lot of them don't know they have it. I talked to the CIO of a, a, a manufacturer that makes the chips to go in most cell phones in, in, in this country, and he told me that I didn't think I had any open source. I went out and I looked at my engineers and, and found out that we had 14 different versions of Linux, uh, of which I think they rolled eight internally. They had, uh, I think it was one-tenth of their servers were running Linux, but they really didn't know it. And that got to the point where it was that knit that I was talking about earlier, saying that how do I bring these back into to my standard environment? So he decided to say, you know what, I'm going to adopt this as a major platform. I know what's happening. Let me go ahead and fund it and adopt it. And the Linux market will grow by 40% over the next uh, two years. These are things that are actually happening, significant market growth that's happening. Now, it is happening, but it's happening with, with uh, growth in, in both support and unsupport, deployment across all verticals. But it's still primarily when we talk about Linux use at the network edge. When we start talking about growth 40% over the next two years, that means some things are going to have to happen for us to get to the point where we're not just talking about those file print webs. We have to start saying, whatever you're running, we have an open source version that we can run for you. That's something that we just don't have today, and we're going to have to spend a lot of money investing in that. Um, key driver still TCO. I can tell you, I, I can probably name on, on, on one hand the number of CIOs that I've talked to who have said that, that TCO or financial discussions haven't been in the, probably the first paragraph of the discussion uh, when they're initially rolling it out. Later they get to the point of, well, there's a lot of things that we can do, but it's still financial decisions. Uh, we're starting to see some late adopters that are usually the government and higher ed, sometimes called later adopters with uh, new technology areas. It's not mainstream. You see from Indiana 101, uh, 101. and emerging markets are, are actually going to be a key driver for us. We believe that we have to take open source to areas that it traditionally has not been in today. There's going to be some bumps, 
But I think we're, we're at the point where we, we need to step out on faith and, and try to foster the community to some areas to go after some, some, some big companies in, in the commercial world as well and go after some heavy-duty projects that we haven't gone after. We'll talk about that. So how do we move? We, you saw that continuum. Where I said we're probably just getting into phase four. How do we move into phase five? How do we really get heavy-duty phase four, which means that we've got functionality that people are looking at and saying, you know what, I want to run my business on this. And then how do we get to other areas where we're getting that whole third-party community around where people are saying, not only am I going to run parts of my business, I'm going to run the most important parts of my business on open source. So we think, again, I talked about this earlier, it's foster innovation in key emerging areas, enterprise class support and distribution channels for open source. So a lot of things, the good things happening in open source, but a lot of large customers are afraid to adopt them in a major way because they have no idea what happens if, what happens when. Um, so they're just saying, yeah, it's great. It makes sense for my environment. I can't tell you the number of times or somebody said, I want to connect this up to my uh, Active Directory or I want to do this, in my, but I have no idea who to talk to if something goes wrong. So again, again, I think it's a learning curve that we need to get to to realize what are re what's really happening and what's really going to drive this, this wide-scale adoption that we all think is coming. Mixed source, again, best of breed environments, allowing them to use what they have today, but making sure that it's an open source platform and then building up from there. And then how do you harden for the SLAs? How do you do the bet your business stuff? So real quickly, some of the emerging areas. We believe that desktop is a significant emerging area. I heard in the back uh, when I was uh, sitting over somebody working on a Nova Linux desktop right now. We've had a lot of interest, significant interest in areas that we didn't think that we were going to have around uh, using a Linux desktop. I mentioned before earlier that when I was at Dell, we had less than 10 uh, servers bought uh, when, we out, we, when we offered a, a version of Linux years ago. Now, again, you can offer, you can buy a, uh, based on some license agreements, what Dell had to do initially was offer you the opportunity to buy a laptop with no operating system, and then you can buy a, um, a your operating system of choice and put it on there. That's early. Hewlett Packer obviously is giving you the option where you can buy uh, with fully loaded with a Linux distribution on your laptop. But the question really comes, what really is a laptop? Or what really is a desktop? What areas make sense for you? And going out and talking to customers and doing our distributions, and again, we've had, um, I think the number is 4 million downloads of Nova Linux desktop since we released it. Significant, significant, significant downloads, verified uh, installs, uh, huge numbers of those. But when we talk to customers, these are the areas, and, and highlighted, it's, it's pretty much not really a, a corporate business laptop. It's not the knowledge worker's laptop or knowledge worker's machine that we're seeing adoption, nor do we think or is, the, uh, is the sweet spot for us today. The reason, uh, open office versus Microsoft. Uh, translation, the drivers, a lot of those people who are in the knowledge worker type of mentalities, and that may be an admin or, or, or a, um, not the corporate developers, but uh, financial analysts, they just need to flip it on and have no problems whatsoever, just be able to run and share their information. We're not there yet. We're not 100% there. We're close, but we're not there yet. But an engineering workstation, um, we have ATMs that out there that are running Nova Linux desktop as their back end. 3270 clients, uh, obviously that's a great fit. You're using anything through a browser. Uh, you guys may not know, but the, um, a large retailer uh, who sells electronics, um, in every store they have three machines. One of those machines, the point of sale is a Windows. Every other machine is a Linux machine because they do browser-based applications. Their, uh, um, their whole goal was to give them more flexibility and say, how can I do more with, with less? So they've set up kind of a remote proxy in, environment. We have a, uh, the largest supermarket store in the southwest uh, U.S. who has, uh, I can't remember the number of chains, but it's a significant number of chains. Every single, their goal is to have every single compute device in their environment from checkout to their pharmaceutical to their back-end uh, in-store processors will be running Linux all from a single boot. So they'll log in, figure out, go to the network, pull down, say, okay, I know your IP, I know who you are, guess what, today you're going to be a, a checkout machine. It'll load that version of the software, load it, and, and actually run. Another version will say, okay, I know who you are, guess what, you're a back-end store processor. So we're seeing people, a lot of people get to the point where they say, this desktop, it makes a lot of sense for us, a lot of flexibility and things that they couldn't do with commercial products. So. We're seeing a lot of things. They talked about what's happening in computer labs, air, airport check-in terminals. One of the major airlines is actually using this. When you go in, you put in your credit card, and it gives you your name. That's actually Linux that's running. Next, what's, our, what's an area that we think we, need, we should spend some time investing in? Well, if you look at those charts earlier, I didn't point it out, but collaboration is, not, is an area that open source really has made no footholds in. 
from, a, from any type of viable share. Let's be honest, the world is still a Lotus Notes, it's still a Microsoft Exchange, and to a lesser extent, it's still a Nobel Group-wise environment. That's where the world is. Now you start talking about doing um, uh, quick and dirty portals, start talk talking about doing content management or SharePoint type of applications, and there really isn't something that's boxed, ready to go, and not have to be boxed, but it's hard and ready to go from the open source environment. It's an area that open source traditionally has not gotten into. I will tell you that um, I used to work at, um, at Lotus before I, I was at Dell. That's a very difficult area to be into, not only from a market dynamics, but also from a functionality performance perspective for what needs to be there. We actually are starting to look at things a little bit differently, and we said with, with the funding, if you guys may have heard, if you go to projecthula.org or project-hula.org, uh, an open source project called Hula, which is really going head-to-head -head in the collaboration market. With it, we donate net mail, but we believe there's a significant market in the, and that the industry is going towards kind of like a Google Mail, which is a corporate environment, a corporate hosted web-based environment where I want full rich client, but I really don't want to have to have, I want to have the flexibility of where I can log in, do other things. We believe that that's a significant market. Customers have told us that. Significant play also for, as I said, for uh, not only a blog type of space, but kind of a SharePoint portal, sharing information type of space. It's a new area that, we, that, that open source does not get into, but again, if we're going to do some things, we need to go into areas where, where a customer may have or a competitor may have 90% marketplace, market share. But that's the areas that we need to go into because those are the growth areas. If we're afraid to go in there, we'll never get anywhere. So Hula, if you look at it from, from uh, I, I remember when we first started talking about this, uh, I remember talking to a president of our company and I said, why would we want to take a, a two by four and smack ourselves in the face? And, you know, he kind of looked at me and, and, and basically said, because of the two-by-four is there and we have a face. We have to do this. Um, I, I quickly ducked and left the room and said, you know, I'm not sure that I want to be involved in, in, that, in, in the two-by-four smacking exercise. But I came to realize that we do need to go after this true innovative markets and, and, and say, yes, we're going to foster this. We're going to do a lot of work here. From a support standpoint, you know, let's be honest, why is Novell into this? Why is Red Hat into this? Why is Oracle and Dell into this? To make money. But there's also a, a greater good, I think, from, from fostering these open source projects and collaboration around portal development and content management, similar to what you saw with Apache, that if some of these corporations don't line up behind it, it's just not going to happen because that's where the money is. You know, Novell as a corporation has, has $1.5 billion in the bank, $1.5 cash to invest on, on certain projects. Um, we know that Microsoft has a significant amount of, of, of cash in the bank as well, but they're probably not going to invest in open source. Um, so there's a lot of things that needs to happen, and I think what we're starting to see, as I said before, is, is that the hackers and suits merge together and realize that together there's a greater good for creating open source and also finding a way that you can run a viable business on it. Now, others that we think are, are innovative areas that we're investing in, something called Mono. You guys may or may, may or not be for, uh, familiar with Mono. It's basically allowing you to run .NET applications on Linux. Again, why would we do that? If you look at it from, from, the, from the outside, yeah, you may get one or two customers who's got an environment and, and they can run a, a cross-platform environment. But realistically, what you're doing is you're setting up .NET and their IDE as, as a default standard. Well, not really. But that's, that's the, the, uh, the negative that we got back from the community was, wait, wait a minute, if we do this, yeah, we can do it. And it's very interesting to develop. But I don't want everybody to think that .NET's the way to go. I like J2E. Well, again, we're trying to focus on choice and options for people. And we have had significant customers who said, I want to run Linux in my environment, but my application base, and let's be honest, operating systems do not run the world. They're not even that important to people. It's the applications that people see that are important. My application base is .NET. My application base is COM, and I've moved it to .NET. I'm going to continue to have it there. However, I think there are certain areas that it makes sense for me to run those in an open source environment. Maybe my remote store areas. Maybe my... Uh, um, uh, one of the large uh, automakers has um, uh, financing shops in malls around the world. Some of these malls are disconnected. But they believe that they can get a, uh, enough, uh, enough of bandwidth where they can have a browser-based access to these guys. And they wanted to run it on a low-cost platform. They wanted to run it on Linux. Their application was written in .NET. Well, Mono came in, and Mono is an application or a framework that gives them that capability. We're also focusing with Mono. just had a call this morning about building a, an integrated development environment, really saying what do we need to do not only just to have the framework and the libraries there, but developers need an IDE. Developers really, that's the focus of the developers. 
.NET is great, don't get me wrong, from a development standpoint. Um, I may not look like it, but I actually do go home and have a pocket protector and a beanie with, with a propeller on it, so I still write some code. .NET's a very good environment, but what makes it is the IDE. The IDE is extremely powerful. Eclipse is great, but there's a lot of things that need to be involved and integrated with that. So we're spending a lot of time in another area where you look at that on the, on the, fr on the, on the face of it and say, why would you go into that area? Again, it's not financial reasons today, but it's really going to lend us to do other things in the environment. Avalanche is another one. And I'm not sure if, you're, if you're familiar with Avalanche, but there's a consortium out uh, with financial services companies, manufacturing companies, and the big three automakers are getting there as well, getting together, really getting uh, pinged today with, e with emails, getting, uh, getting together and saying, you know what, we know that there's an environment that's out there, and we know that there's open source uh, software that we need for our environments. I, I was talking to, I can give you their name, I was talking to Ford, CIO of Ford told me, he says, you know what, I have a platform that I want all of my distributors to run. He says, but some of my distributors, they make a door handle for the left door of a Taurus. They, they only make the left side door. That's all they do. I think that's an interesting business to be in. But I need these guys, and you know what? I don't want to, and I tell them I, that I want them to run this, this stack, but they really, I can't force them to run it. I, I don't have the ability to force these guys to run it. They're not my dealers. They're my suppliers. However, if you could, were able to get together with me, and you were able to put together an open source stack for me that, would, that I know you would support, that we would push, I could get all of my suppliers, and guess what? I could probably get the suppliers of Chrysler, Dahmer Chrysler, and I could probably get suppliers of GM to use that stack in their environment. So they're getting together and figuring out what are the things that we need to do and that are common that open source can help us. Same thing in the FinServe market. They're looking at it and saying, hey, when I'm posting a, 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 um, a lock on a, on, a, on a transaction, that's something of functionality, again, some, some back-end functionality that I would like to have some standardization. I've got some software, but... I can't force all of, all of my day traders, I can't force all of my uh, remote sites to use that. But you have some power in the open source community. Can you put together a stack for me? And that's what Avalanche is really about. How do we put together some innovative stacks focused at consortiums and, and build those together? So there's a lot of things that we're going after, and we think that those are probably three areas. The desktop, um, Project Kula, I guess it's more than three, Mono. Uh, the IDE that goes with Mono from Development and Avalanche. Those are some key areas that, we're, we're, that we believe are the focus areas that are going to drive open source. Now, global interest in Linux desktop. China, I talked about China and what's happening there. Australia uh, and me, I won't spend much time on this. But there's a lot of what we're seeing is that there's a lot of um, legislative uh, things that are happening around the world that are making it much easier for us to adopt and use open source. In Brazil, for example, there's a lot of uh, legislation that, that says, you know what, before they had to have a single, literally they had to have a single supplier uh, for a lot of these government uh, entities because again they bought into a strategy and they wanted to cost and they negotiated cost. Now they've created legislation saying no, you have to have at least a lower cost alternative as well for some of the other government entities, and that falls directly into what we can offer them. They also like the fact that in some of these organizations um, that they are are spurning, as we saw in China, some localization that they're going to add on to these open source projects. So there may be a Brazil version of an open source project or a China version of, a, of an open source project or a uh, Guatemala version or whatever it may be that will allow some local flavor to be put into these individual projects. So you'll see an enterprise version of it, and then I think you'll actually see some localization happening as well. Okay. So next thing we talked about was one of our four areas was enterprise glass distribution channels for open source software. You guys probably see the, the, uh, the companies down at the bottom, Sugar CRM, Astaro, Pentaho, Groundwork, MySQL, and the, the others go happen. All very fairly successful open source projects. One problem with each one of these, though. It's not a functional problem. It's not a, a, a leadership problem. It's not a directional problem. It's the fact that when a customer, a large Fortune 100 or Fortune 10 or Fortune 1000 customer says, I'm interested in running an open source, maybe it's a Sugar or CRM for my CRM, who do I call to get this thing fixed? They all have the vision that it's, that it's a Swedish guy named Lars who's writing all this code, and if Lars gets sick, their, their entire environment's going to go down. I mean, literally, that's what they believe. Um, they also believe that they can't make any changes, and once they make a change, and they, and they, that they're going to have to distribute it back out to the world. So it, there's a lot of confusion in, in the corporate world about what really open source is. I had a couple of slides here to talk about the issues around licensing that these guys are facing. But... We looked at this and said, for us to be successful with open source, as we talked about the third party, we have to ensure that others are successful with open source. 
We can't be the, 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 the lone white horse running out there in the wind. We've got to be sure that open source as a general uh, environment is successful out there. One of the problems when we talked to these guys, we talked to the Pentos, the Sugars, the Staros, and uh, Apgen, so on and so forth, and said, what is the issue that you face? They said, look, we're great at taking this open source project and open source code, and we're, at, we're great at putting it together. What we don't have is we don't have 7,000 salespeople around the world. We're never going to have 7,000 salespeople. We don't have a support organization. And we don't have the, 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 the knowledge of what you guys do, not only uh, Novell, but also Red Hat and others. We don't have the knowledge of what you guys are doing and what your soup really looks like internal to your engine. What's, what's really happening in your kernel? We have an idea at this level, but we need to get that level. And we thought about it and said, you know, that makes a lot of sense for, for us to spend some time with select partners and the project co uh, that we've called Market Start and actually take these guys and really treat them as an incubator where we're not taking an ownership in this individual company and we're not doing anything, but we're really trying to accelerate their adoption because we believe that their adoption in enterprises will give up, open up the door for the rest of us from an open source and say, now open source is in there, I see some functionality, well, let me, I'm going to need a tool to manage it. Again, what's the bottom line in all this? We know what the bottom line is in, in, for most corporate entities. It's try to find a way to make some money. Um, and, and I'm going to be honest with you about that, that the reason we're doing this wasn't that we had a specific reason that we wanted to have MySQL or Pinto or AppGen succeed. We wanted to make sure that open source succeeded because we believe that if open source succeeds, that Novell as a corporation will succeed. So all these companies, we now have uh, quarterly technical reviews with them. They all have access to what we're doing in, in, in the guts of our uh, distribution. They all uh, get access to, um, at various levels, with, to our salespeople, and our salespeople will actually push their software. And they all will, we're working on either level one, level two, or level three, well, level two or level three uh, support for all of these. So General Motors or Ford or you name, you name your company of choice could buy Pentaho, but they could have back-end support. It looks like Pinto is giving them that support, but it may be Novell on the back end doing some of this stuff. Again, the reason is we want to make sure that there's enterprise class-ready customers out there. Mixed source. Third one I had on my list was mixed source. How do we get the best of breed environments for customers? As I said before, it's not a rip and replace when you start talking to these enterprise customers of pulling one out and pulling another one in. Just because it happens to be open source, if I've got a, uh, a, a DB2 or an Oracle environment, it's a rip and replace for me. That's what I'm seeing, and there's cost involved with that. And in fact, let's say that I'm an environment, and you know what? I want to run Linux in my environment. I even want to run a, an open source provisioning tool. I even want to run an open source monitoring environment. But the way I do my backups today and the way that I do my clustered file system, I love Veritas. And I've spent a lot of money on Veritas. I just re-upped my contract. If, if you don't integrate well with that, if you don't, we don't have some intrusive kernel, kernel modifications there, I can't work with you guys. And I'll stick with whatever version of uh, commercial software that I'm on. Um, so we, we looked at this and we said, let, let's, let's kind of outline what's the difference between open source and, and the significant value in, in the private commercial um, uh, applications. And we found value in both of them. And, and being a vendor that, that shifts both of them, obviously we would, let's be honest here. But open source traditionally provides low-cost alternatives and provides flexibility, and we talked about this earlier, and significant speed of innovation. Sometimes it may not be truly innovation, but there's a speed. If there's a problem, you can throw that community in the pack of dogs, we'll fix that problem in, in a significant shorter period of time than it is to get a, a point release from a commercial software company. Sounds great. Then you start looking at it and you think, well, there's a reason that Oracle is Oracle is Oracle. There's a reason that, that they've been there is because they've got years of in-depth in research. They've got, I'm not sure how many of you guys have been to their headquarters, but they've got tons of towers that look like database spindles sitting right there in San Jose, uh, south of San Francisco, that all these people are focusing all their mind and all their energy on building a better database, quicker, faster, stronger, the $6 million man story. That's all they're doing is building that environment. So, and they know what their customers want, and they've built functionality specifically for specific customers, something an open source prop doesn't do a very good job at. They have targeted functionality. So there's benefits of both, and they've usually got some things that are probably a little bit more hardened than some of the other projects. And if it's not hardened, at least you've got one throat to choke if something goes wrong. So there's benefits to both. So we looked at that, and we said, you know what, what we need to do when it makes sense is come up with a mixed source strategy. Let's marry the benefits of open source and the open source model with the best of commercial. So what we've done is kind of with our, we've opened up our distribution as opposed to our major competitor and said that we will make intrusive kernel modifications for commercial applications. 
So we went out for Veritas, for example. Veritas to work, to work extremely well and to work better uh, on our environment than any other environment. They needed a couple of, they needed 12 inter intrusive kernel modifications. They actually needed us to actually do some and embed some of their code. Virtual iron, same exact thing. Um, uh, there's about four or five others where we made a uh, polyserve. They said, we need these code changes. And we thought about it. We, we, we looked at that and said, well, we don't want to actually, you know, sp spike a kernel. We don't want to fork things. But if our customers are running this and we want them to run open source as their platform and use that, as we always said, as the Trojan horse to get other open source in, we've got to make sure that they can keep their current environment running. We can't say, well, yeah, you know what? Veritas is great, but guess what? Have you heard about this open source clustered file system? That's going to solve the problems for you. That's the quickest way to get kicked out of some of these customers. So we said, hey, if you want to use Veritas, that's fine. We're going to provide a platform for that. And guess what? We've done kernel modifications. We've done testing. We've built those in. At the same time, we funded, and this was, this was our goal, anytime we do an uh, a, uh, intrusive kernel modification for a commercial or private software, we will fund, we will develop, we will support the community, and we will integrate into our base platform an open source version. So we did the Veritas clustered file system. Well, we worked with Oracle, and Oracle had something called OCFS, which was the, uh, basically the uh, clustered file system for their RAC software. We worked with them, expanded that, and made OCFS2, which is now a general purpose clustered file system, which ships free of charge in our distribution. Same thing we did for, um, for volume managers. We did a volume management deal with, with, a, with a commercial product. We did the same exact thing and, and spent a lot of time with EVMS. We did a lot of things that, what, so our goal is whatever we do commercial, we're going to fund an open source project, and we're going to actually put that into our distribution. Why? And, well, again, we talked about the Trojan horse. We've seen it. We, we had customers who were running Veritas in certain parts of the environment. They got in there, and they said, well, you know what? You're right. This OCFS isn't that bad. Or we had one customer who came to us and said they wanted to run GFS on, on SUSE. So we, we made the modifications for them, and, and, and they can run GFS on SUSE. And they said, you know, it's not that bad. I, I, maybe you're right. I don't need to have uh, this commercial software in there for this part of my environment. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really run my world. I, there are alternatives out there. But to do that and to allow them to have that mixed source environment, we thought that this was critical. So we think mixed source is a way that we're going to have to find a way to work well with private software. Don't care who the vendor is. Don't care what the, what the overall is. Because again, the end goal is what's the user need? What makes sense for the end user? And that was why we came with mixed source. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and the, you know the question is really when we, when we talk about the intrusive kernel modifications. Let's take for example um, some things that we did with SAP or Veritas. If we put some commercial things into our into our soup, if you will, well then didn't we just change our what we're doing? We don't have to include a different license in there. Well, we're, we're very clear what, with these guys. Whatever you give to us and whatever modifications you want, we don't want, what we're trying not to do is consume their software. Let's make the changes in our software so theirs can work better. Because that, that was an issue that came up. And we're also now getting very tight before who makes, you know, it's, it's a very high bar you've got to leap for us to get to that, that we're actually going to do that kernel modification. Our friends in North Carolina, they won't do anything. Everything's got to be open source. We looked at it and said, well, you know what, if you're somebody, you've got 90% of market share, which Veritas does in certain verticals, Guess what? If you want to get in that environment, you've got to make sure that it works. So what we're trying to do is not take their software, trying to build the, the kernel and changes in our end instead of consuming theirs. Because that, that's a good question, because that was an issue that came up. Yes, sir? Yes. Uh, some of them have gone back. Some of them, well... It, it, it depends on the individual um, uh, contribution. Some of the more general ones have gone back to mainline. Some of the other ones will stay SUSE specific. Um, but everything that we do, again, with our, our the way we build our technology, everything we do goes back in to the to the uh, to back up to the what, what, what our friends in Germany called the Uber Collective. Um, so we, we give it back to the to the, uh, to the community, and then it's the community's choice of what happens with that. So we do donate it all back, and that's one thing we tell these guys. So hey, Veritas, if you want to give us something that you think is your bet your business holy grail, guess what? The Uber Collective will get it the next day. It's going to be an open SUSE. Um, so again, the strategy again: whatever we do commercial, we're going to have the exact same functionality available open source, 
and something that's been extremely successful for us and we think it's a differentiator for us. Just put this up there, some, some of our major partners on both sides, and you'll see some functionality is, is, is very similar. Uh, but whatever we do commercial, and that's another version of Market Start as well. Some of the Market Start open source, we're not going to put on a distribution, but we are going to spend time make, making sure that they're successful. Uh, an example of mixed source for us is a product we have called OES. Well, OES basically ships in a box, and, and let, let's be honest, OES is basically a, a rebranding of Nobel Netware. So you take Nobel Netware, and what we do in the box when you install it, it says, guess what, do you want to install on the Nobel Network kernel and run Nobel Netware and have that? If you say yes, you're fine, and you're running the next version of Netware. We also say, and this is actually the default, do you want to run this on SUSE Linux? You say yes, it installs SUSE Linux, then installs, and, and some of these are now open source, but installs uh, the, uh, their Novell Netware services directly on that. So as far as they know, they're running Novell Netware, but they are running on an open source platform. And the version that gets installed in there, some of these things for iFolder and, and iManager, some of those are, are open source or very soon will be open source. So again, um, it's the, the Trojan horse strategy again. Get in there with the functionality that they want, which is not the operating system, let's be clear. It's the, it's the application functionality, and then once they're in there, they can start to see the benefits of what open source has facilitated them to do. So we're, we're doing with, with our, this is where the majority of our revenue still comes from, we're doing with our, 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 our Bet Your Business product as well, OES. It's a mixed source where our, the primary default is open source. Okay, um, development. This is a quick and dirty, because I, I actually changed the slide a little bit, because it was two marketing X. So remember, there's a pretty picture at the bottom half here. So feel free to ooh and ah at any time. Um, but I actually just put this a little bit later because it, it, it fit a little better from the flow from the development. But we have a build and release uh, community-based, community-focused uh, build and release site where, where we do our development and somewhere there may be daily builds that are out there for open source. And that's where we, we, where we have, basically, if you think about it, and again, our, our German friends call it the Uber code, we have one distribution. And that one distribution is everything that we have, all 3,600 packages that, that we have. And then um, we're one code base. And then we make certain distributions off of that. We make three distributions. One's called SUSE Linux, and that's SUSE Linux geared toward the developer, towards the enthusiast. Um, and that's certain packages that, that are in there. And I think it's probably 1,800 packages, I think, that are in there. Then we have uh, the Nova Linux desktop. Talked about that earlier. That's our desktop workstation backend we're using for, for clients. And that's a smaller amount. I think it's 1,100, 1,200 packages, something like that. And then we have SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, SLES, which is the, you know, that's, that's your, your enterprise class server. And what, what we do is, again, having that, that Uber code base, the code 10, we call it, that with all the packages in there, and then just taking the package that makes sense for the distribution that, that people are running, allows us to do something that's very important. Allows us to certify applications at that Uber code base level. So that you know if you write an application and it runs on Nova Linux 10, the desktop, it's going to run on the server, vice versa. So we've taken out, because again, our goal here, because it, it uh, was actually kind of hard to get to this common code base. There's a lot of money that we spent. Our goal here is to facilitate third parties in actually uh, certifying to our platform. So they didn't have to worry about, oh, I'm, I'm certified for SUSE Linux 10, but I'm certified for the enterprise server version 8.2. No, no, now you're certified at code 10, certain code level, and that works for across the entire platform. Now, we take a snapshot of code 10 uh, periodically, and that's SUSE Linux, the, the box version that you, that you can buy in a Best Buy or whatever. Daily builds, whenever we do, that's on OpenSUSE.org. So if you want the whole 3,600 packages or 38, whatever it may be today, that's what's up there. We, we launched that at Linux World in San Francisco, and since then we've had 13 million page views, 750,000 verified installations, there's a way that we can verify that you actually installed it, because once it installs it, it comes back to the mothership to get, to get the last little bit of, uh, uh, of knowledge. Uh, and it really comes down to really one installation every 12 seconds. So I've been talking for a long time now, and there's a lot of people that have gone to OpenSUSE and installed uh, either once or twice or many times uh, our OpenSUSE version. Now, that's important just from creating the, the access to the community. I'm going to talk about later how that fits with our overall strategy. Now. When you look at it, we talked about this earlier, Linux in the enterprise, Linux in the environment, where is it really flourishing? Well, it's, it's flourishing, as we said earlier, in, in, in the network edge areas, this, these file and print, these web servers, things of that nature. The bet your business is really around your network services, your mainframe, your database clusters. That's your bet your business. We are, went out and talked to customers, and they said, you know, yeah, 
Linux is bet your business. I mean, those are my bet your business areas, but Linux isn't there yet. Here's another continuum where we think, again, we're just getting into phase four, which is Linux being able to provide SLA, meaning five nines uptime, never going to go down, similar to what they have in their Unix environments for, all, for, the, for everything that they do, being able to be a self-healing environment. We're just getting to that. We've been focusing on Unix to Linux. We've been focusing on price performance. We've been focusing on uh, the base functionality. And again, certain areas, web servers. We're getting to the point where we can get to the on-demand computing. We're getting to the point where we can get to the point of the SLAs. To get there, we went out to customers and said, what are the issues that you're facing? I don't care about our operating system. We talked to people who couldn't even spell Linux. Talked to a lot of people who were 100% Linux. Said, what are the issues that you face in your environment today? They said, you know what, we've got so many servers that are out there, and pretty much all, every server that we have, we, we get a new application, we buy a new server. I talked to, again to a, a CIO of a major company, and he walked me around his data center, and he said, you know, the average application, it costs about $7,500 for it to get it in. Fully loaded, when we put it in, it's about $30,000. He said, the next application is going to cost $189 million. And my response, literally, I was like, dude, that's a big app. And he was like, no. I'm out of the data center room. I've got to buy a new data center. I've got to build a new data center because one app, one server is killing us. He says, and I have no way to manage this. And now you're talking about I've got to migrate from Unix to Linux. Well, how do I get, go from one server, I was running an E15K, and now you're telling me that I'm going to go to six two-ways. How do I manage six two-way servers the same that I managed one 15-way server or whatever, was 64-way server? How do I do that? Yeah, the Intel chips are faster. 3.8 gigahertz is faster than 2.1. I know the math, but I'm going to need that many more people. How do I do that? So capacity is, is, is a big issue. So again, one server, one application, you got a lot of servers that are running at 10% utilization. They're running, they're happy, but they're at 10% utilization. Deploying a new service, as I said before, is a new server, difficult to manage. Um, configuration and tuning, because it's one application, one server, they, they really can't do application stacking because they've tuned it probably for one application in their environment, and it may not work for the other applications. They pick a happy medium and say, let's, let's tune here, as opposed to focusing on what the, the most optimal view would be. Fault containment. How can I do application stacking, and how can I do virtualization for that point, if I don't know that one application is not going to bring down the kernel or bring down something and, and just hose up my entire, my entire environment? A lot of these are custom apps that they've migrated over that weren't written for the specific operating system. Lockups occur for these guys, and it's causing them to say, wow, I, I don't really think this is ready for me yet. Uh, configuration management. So those are the issues that we saw, and we said that you know, to, to get to the point where we can get to the, to the better business applications, those are the key areas, consolidation, disaster recovery, virtualization, workload management, and automation and, and orchestration. I'm not going to go through all of them. But we looked at it, and we, then we went out and talked to the analysts, and they said, well, from a data center perspective, what we're looking at is, well, from a workplace, people want to be able to have that work anywhere, work, do whatever they want. Networks getting to all IP enterprises. And again, this is, there's a time frame here. But we, we're starting to see that data centers are getting to the point where they're looking at things as resources. And take the right resource, match it with the application, match it with the user at runtime, and make all those things happen, and make those commodities happen, and, and have them available for people. It's kind of hard to do. It's, it's much easier to do if I know the hardware, if I know the operating system, and I know the application have all been written as one stack. If they're all in, individuals and I don't know who wrote one, I don't know how these things integrate, a lot of times there's configuration issues that happen. So what we looked at was a couple of different programs, to, to the foundational programs to put these things together. First one was called Validated Configuration, which was a service, again, to say, yes, you can run Betcha Business things on open source. Yes, you can find a way to do it, and let's talk about how do you do that. Uh, then some enabling technology put in a distribution, and then something we would call a data center manager. So let's quickly go through um, validated configurations. I won't spend much time on this because it's really more service-focused as opposed to software. But we looked at it and said, this is a traditional stack in an environment. I've got hardware all the way up to my line of business applications, and I'm framing with management and security. Well, if I look at that, and I take an individual stack of that, an individual slice of that, that's really what an application stack looks like. So if I get JBoss as my, my application, or J2E running on JBoss, connecting to MySQL, running on an HP server, uh, connecting up to some type of Hitachi storage, that's a stack. Well, the problem is I can buy that stack from Sun. I can buy that stack from, from IBM. 
I can buy that stack from HP on Unix, fully integrated, ready to go. And they, they, they can tell me that they've already had that and integration's there and that the memory's done, everything's geared towards that particular application stack. Well, it gets a lot different when I start talking to the fact that, well, you know what? The operating system doesn't know the hardware. The hardware, well, it's got an HPA that's for this particular operating system. It's got to talk to the storage. And, and, and now I've got to talk to this application environment. I really don't know what the application is doing because they're all written by individual components, written by people. You get to that configuration management issue. You get to that where you've got significant problems. So we put together a program that says, let's build from top to bottom, from application, end user application to individual storage, let's build a configuration. And let's take that configuration, let's manage it as one product. So we're working with our, with our, pro our providers, you can actually go to HP right now and buy a high performance computing cluster, which from the, from the storage all the way up to the individual application is open source, and we have a commercial or a mixed source version as well, but we will treat that entire product as one, as, or that entire stack as one product. All the drivers, everything in there as one product. We built another one with uh, JBoss. We actually did two. We built one with JBoss and Oracle and JBoss and MySQL. Again, working on HP, in this case, HP Pro, ProLiant Blades, where you can go to HP and buy a blade system which will come pre-configured with that stack already on that. We will update it periodically, probably biannually. We did our, our first rev for one of these on a quarterly basis. Um, but we will manage that as an entire stack, so you don't have to worry about, well, do I have to go to JBoss? We will guarantee that they all work well together. That's our, that's, we're the soup in, in this. If you look at it from a financial perspective, you know, SUSE Linux is, is, the, is the least expensive thing in, in, in that overall stack. But we're, we're, we're kind of, we see ourselves as Switzerland. We're the one that really doesn't really have a, a, a care of what's happening from a driver or all the other perspectives. Our goal is to make sure everything works well together, again, to allow you to use open source in your environment. Makes a lot of sense, except for a customer who says, well, you know what, I've got things running in my environment which are proprietary and commercial, and I want to run open source as part of that, but I'm not sure. Well, we've also got another version of the program where we're now going out to customers and saying, if you've got a stack, it's got SUSE Linux, if it's got an open source component, we'll take that stack and consume it and put it in our labs, re-engineer it, and then we'll manage that stack itself as a product. So we have um, the second largest financial institution in Germany, actually the largest in Germany, who's actually given us stacks. One of the uh, big three automakers has given us stacks. Um, the largest bank in California has given us stacks and said, here are stacks that we want you to manage. They're mixed source stacks, but manage them as one. Give us updates. Make sure the integration's there. Yes, sir. Yes. That is a, uh, a, a margin is not an issue with that service. That is a, that is a let me give you an example. Um, the CIO of a, of a uh, transportation company, well, package delivery company, uh, specializing in giving you things overnight, told me, he says, every dollar that I've made from going to open source, I've lost in configuration management. Every single dollar. In fact, I'm negative now. And I was like, you did something wrong. But he said, every single dollar because I've got more servers, more people to manage it, and, and more things out there. And I, I was, something's, something's wrong there. And he says, the problem is, not in getting it up and running, the problem is that what happens if, if kernel.org tells me there's a change that's out there, and they tell me, because every single one, if you look at them, says it's a security change, security issue, or there's a performance one. Or let's say in his case, Oracle comes out and they say there's a new version and we think you should upgrade. We have no idea what to do, and we spend time in our lab doing all these changes and figure out should we, what they call red light, yellow light, green light, should we do it? We're willing to go to you guys and pay you significant amounts of money because, again, I've got seven people, that's all they do full-time, all year, is configuration management doing that. We're willing to pay you to give us that red light, yellow light, green light, and if it's a problem, we come back to you. Now, we don't do it for every stack. Obviously, you know, it, it's, it's, it becomes cost prohibitive for us, but there, it is a service charge. The first one, uh, where we're actually creating stacks, that's free of charge. You can go to our website, nobel.com slash VCP, and download the, the information about these stacks. Um, all that's there about, hey, there's, what's the HP stack look like? What's the configuration? You can build it yourself. But if you want us to maintain one for you, we'll actually put it in our labs. We'll actually run it. New version of kernel, a new kernel comes out or a new update. We'll actually go through and do all the engineering to say red light, yellow light, green light, should you do it. So it is a service offering. Uh, but I, I will tell you that when I, when I first um, uh, put, this, put pen to paper on this one and was going out talking to customers and saying, is this something that's, that's of use to you? It was interesting, I was, in, I was in Europe when I was doing it. 
every single customer that I went to, and these are large the large customers, a lot of them were not Novell customers, said, can you give me a proposal today? And that's when we realized that how significant the configuration management issue has come once somebody gets to, not talking about 50 servers or 20 servers, when we start talking about thousands of servers and thousands of different versions of things running, it's a major issue for these guys. We come. Yeah. What we've done is that we, we've gone out to um, our major um, partners. So we've gone out to HP, IBM. That's why we don't do every stack. HP, IBM, Dell, and we've gotten uh, the, the basic platforms from them. We've got different versions and different terminals. And we tell the customers we may not have all the exact same firmware, but we're probably the same hardware. If not, we can do it on your site. And we've got a tool, and, and I'll talk about it later, something called Auto Build, which uh, we've modified a little bit to go in and actually do to build a stack with them and to, to configuration, tell all the dependencies and what's there. And, uh, and to get it up and running. And then what we do is we have a, a, another tool which actually goes through kind of like a load runner and says, here's the performance expected. Now how do we do tweaks and tunes to that and how do we maintain it? The, the hardest part is actually not getting the stack built. It's actually dealing with changes. Because every single vendor, software vendor, Novell included, is going to tell you, oh, that's fixed in version 5. <laughs> and they all want you to go to that next version, but that's not, you know, that, can't happen in large enterprises. Sometimes it takes 18 months to get to the next version. So it's the, main, the maintenance of it that's been the biggest problem so far. But again, this has just, just gone, um, uh, I was going to say gone gold, but just gone to the full release. But in the pilot stage, the biggest issue was, the, the, was the, the dealing with the changes. What we've also hooked up from it, just to give you some back end, is we, we hooked up um, kind of a remote management software that if you want us to, we will actually make the changes behind the scene to one of your servers. You can replicate it or we'll make it all your servers, um, and we'll manage it from, uh, in this case, from Provo, from Utah. So we're trying to figure out a way that we can get it out there, because the biggest issue is maintenance of the stack once it's, got, once it's there. Okay, enabling technologies. Real quick on this one, I talked about the key things that we thought were important uh, to get this thing really rocking and rolling enterprise class. We spent a lot of money on Heartbeat DRDB. IBM came to us and said, we want to make sure that we can release 32-way active-active from an open source perspective. We've got to have that in there. Uh, we don't have the resources to do it. You guys spend a lot of money and time, develop that, focus on it. We did that. We put four guys who absolutely do nothing in Germany, but they do storage, our storage platform, which has dear to be heartbeat as, as our high availability. We also have something called business continuity clustering, which was a Novell product, which did geographically dispersed clusters. How do I have a cluster in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, and how do I make all those guys work well together for a disaster recovery? Well, we open source parts of that. Parts of it are still private. Uh, open source parts of that and made that work with that with a DRDB so you can have geographically dispersed and localized clusters working in the same environment, working well together. I thought that was a significant importance. High availability was a key issue we heard from these customers. Storage management, I talked about OCFS, I talked about uh, NFS v4 and our commitment there, and also the Veriserve, Polyserve, doing the uh, what we need to do with the kernel. Uh, fault management, interesting one here. Talking about intrusion protection and separation of duties, we bought a company called Immunex that had a product, a commercial product called App Armor. And what App Armor really did was, um, uh, what App Armor did was it, it, it did intrusion protection. It didn't stop something from happening and it did fault containment. But if something happened in your environment, let's pull that, pull that system and pull that application or pull that stack, whatever it's wrapping, let's pull that out and not let it affect any place else in my environment. So we pulled that. So you can put a wrap around through policies, put a wrap around either an application, set of applications, or an environment. Uh, and if something happens in there based off this policy tripping, it'll pull out access so that, yeah, you still got a problem, but it's, it's, it's localized now. So it's intrusion protection, and you can go in and determine who did what. We've open sourced that. Um, that's fully open source now. You're going to be able to get the base functionality in, in our SUSE Analytics 10, which ships um, the last commercial here, uh, second week in May uh, this year. Um, it's actually already locked, socked, that's not fully. Parts of it are, but we're, we're going through certification now. Um, but that ships there, and we've gone to kind of the um, virus protection model, where you, you, buy, you get the, the base package, but there's updates that come out, and we find that, hey, there's a, an intrusion protection issue here, or a containment issue here, you can download the pattern for it, and that's on a subscription basis. But the base software is there, you can build your own subscriptions, do what you need to. And then virtualization, which was probably got more buzz than anything that, that has ever happened in the open source market, uh, environment. And talking with Ian and those guys at Zen Source, the, the amount of, of interest that they had around Zen and virtualization was phenomenal. 
we talked to our customers and, and they said, yeah, it's interesting, but we're not going to run into production just yet. And then we talked to them six months later and they said, how come we don't have a pilot yet? How come you don't have a preview version? We've got to have this now. If it's going to be critical, if we're ever going to do anything with you guys, we've got to have Zen in today. So Zen became very important to us, and, and, and we looked at that and said, what do we really need to do with virtual machines? Well, we've got to have, have performance, which is, hey, if I'm running a virtual machine, I want to have the same performance in my virtual machine as I do in my base machine if it wasn't virtualized. Scalability, fault isolation, um, isolation, and the ability to run disparate OSs. We need all that. We chose para-virtualization, which is Zen. There's a couple of different ways we could have gone this. Um, there's two different ways, primarily virtualization. There's full virtualization uh, on your left-hand side, and that's basically, um, give you uh, um, an example, that's, that's traditional VMware, where you've got an operating system, you run something on top of it, that's GSX, runs on top of it, um, and then you can create your own virtual machines on top of that. Then there's para-virtualization, where you actually have your operating system built into that operating system um, uh, is a VMM, a virtual machine monitor, and then you actually load in your operating systems on top of that, and, and there's an API, and it talks to the API, and it actually does, the API does the management of the resources to say, this virtual machine needs this, needs to talk to the disk now, this guy doesn't, this virtual machine needs memory, this guy needs it now, and that API does all that management. That's what VMware's um, ESX does, and what Zen does, uh, XEN. Now, we've decided to go this way because we found that you can get almost no performance degradation. You can actually have a machine that has, let's say, eight to ten virtual machines running on it. All eight or ten of those virtual machines will run just as fast, about 93 percent, 97 percent return, as if the machine was running without uh, virtualization on it. Significant benefit. Now, if you talk about, about full virtualization, the best you're going to get and the best with, with running it downhill in a hurricane is probably around 70 percent. Regardless, regardless, I got that on the next slide. Um, regardless of that, so and the 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 issue there is that again, we've actually made kernel modifications for that API and that virtual machine monitor to do that because it's it's the API that does all of it. It's not any secret sauce. It's it's integrating that into uh, Zen 3.0 and the libraries they have, integrating that into our distribution, and that virtual machine monitor is where all the where all the sauce comes from. Now, what does this give us? And this is where VT comes in. It gives us the ability to, to, to in our distribution, to allow customers to, to uh, create their own virtual machines. So what you have is really your hardware. You have a hypervisor. That's uh, Zen, the virtual machine monitor. And then on top of that hypervisor, you create uh, basically a virtual machine stack, which is an, an operating system. And it's got your memory. It's got access to memory. It thinks it's actually a physical machine. And what happens is this VMM application manages all that, manages all the, the APIs. Here are the drivers we, we talked about earlier, the, the APIs. And they get direct access or they get access through a library to that operating system and to the hardware. So they're actually managing all that through APIs. What VT chips do, if VT, now the difference here is that they allow you to run modified guest, meaning that the modified guest here is, is in this case, let's say this is uh, SUSE Linux. In this case over here, that it happens to be uh, Novell Netware. Strange I picked those two, but those are the two I picked. So I can run those, and they're modified guests, meaning I've made changes for that API to talk to my operating system. Well, that's great, but what, let's say I want to run an unmodified guest. The number one that people want to run is Windows. The issue really isn't with Zen. It's the way that, that Windows is written. But again, regardless, I want to run an unmodified operating system and should be able to, to rock and roll and do that. Well, with uh, AMD and Intel, with Vanderpool and Pacifica, uh, reverse respectively, you can actually do that. So what that allows you to do is run virtualization on a chip, have it all managed through the same interface, but then run an unmodified guest along with a modified guest. So it gets kind of confusing if you look at it, but what this allows me to do is use the same management console, and that management console will talk to the, to the uh, VT chip, which has got virtualization on it, and it will talk to the Zen interface, which is running on my operating system, allow me to create virtual machines through that same management interface to both. So ideally, I would love to run uh, and, and still get the same performance get, and get the hypervisor because it's done at the chip level at, at that point. Um, and the, the key here is the performance. And that's the reason I, that we've modified these guests is that we wanted to run para-virtualization, as we talked about, and get that performance through those APIs so we had to modify the OSs. Um, you're going to see a lot of OSs. You're going to see Zen as a host, uh, as a host environment. Oracle is going to have it as a host. Uh, there's talk that our friend's uh, uh, son is going to have it as, as a host environment. Uh, 
Yeah. They have it right. Yeah. And you're going to see it, uh, a whole new market come up of uh, third-party people, tout virtual platform, uh, a lot of people creating these virtual machine managers to manage these virtual machines based off, off, off a lot of different things. So this is coming. Uh, 3.0 is what everybody's waiting for. They're about two months late, uh, Ian. They actually came to us, um, between you, me, and I guess the microphone. Um, they actually came to us and said, hey, we're a little bit late in building um, Zen, and we're like, we know. Um, and everybody was really waiting for this, and we had a lot of customers, which we had some significant uh, contractual things built into based on them uh, uh, meeting this code date, and they said, we can't do it. We actually lent them three or four developers to actually get the code 3.0 running because what they were doing, um, they're doing a great job. The guys at Oxford do a great job. They had focused some of their, because you guys know there's Zen, and now there's Zen Source, which is a company, a, a venture-based company. They had taken some of their developers and focused them on building the management tools, and the actual open source project had kind of fell, fallen behind. Um, that's been fixed. That's been changed. We've, we gave some people, honestly, to be uh, fully open here, Red Hat gave some people and Oracle gave some people as well, and we actually built that and, and built some more development uh, uh, resources there. So that is going to ship. We actually have a preview version of this shipping today in our SUSE Linux, again, geared towards the, the uh, um, uh, development and enthusiast community. In Code 10, that second week of May, when SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 10 uh, version ships, it will be embedded in there with management tools as well. Okay. So let me round up real quick and, and put this all together. And this is where, where things get really interesting. This is a, basically a, a view of the traditional commercial Linux today, where I've got applications that are in there. I've got a JBoss, or I've got something in there. I've got it all integrated in there with hardware system drivers. And because we talked about this earlier in the back, I don't know what hardware you're running. If you tell me you're running IX, I can tell you the hardware you're running. Tell me you're running HPUX, I know that you're, what type of boxes you're running. You're running Linux, I've got to ask you another question, probably two or three. Um, so I've got to put all my drivers in there. So I've got all my drivers, I've got all the kernel, I've got everything in there in a traditional classic Linux, Linux distribution. This is SUSE Linux today. This is SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. Everything's in there. It's a platform really geared towards static general purpose applications, general purpose environments. We're creating a new paradigm where we're creating something called P-Distro and V-Distro. You guys are probably only the third group to see this. But we're actually separating it and saying, we want to create something called a P-Distro geared towards physical servers and only put in the components that deal with physical servers. So that would be the hardware drivers. That would be the kernel. That would be the hypervisor, the management agents for a particular piece of hardware. So that means that I may have a P-Distro for IBM. I may have a P-Distro for various versions of IBM and a P-Distro for HP, P-Distro for Dell, you name it, Fujitsu Siemens. But a version of the operating system which is very thin, very focused, towards their particular platform. We may even let them create their own P-Distro. It's up in the air. But it's, it doesn't have all the other stuff in it. And then we're talking about V-Distros. And V-Distros really means virtual, but, it, but not the way that you think about it. And it's really geared towards taking everything that's needed to run an application. Forget the hardware now. That's gone. We've already taken that. It's an application. Let's create, and go to the, anybody that's a Visual Basic pro programmer, create a runtime version of your application meaning that this is everything, a single encapsulated version of the operating system, the application, everything that you need to run an application. So we've got a vDistro, which is a runtime version, a runtime stack environment. Forget the word operating system anymore. That's irrelevant. Now it's an application with all the tools necessary to run. And I've got a piece of hardware, and I put on top of that a, a, a pDistro. Now, how do I do that? There's a process we talk, asked earlier about how, do I, how are we going to build some of these stacks. We have a process called uh, auto build. Uh, and actually, you can see the UBA right here. This is a slide that our, my friends in Germany made uh, in Nuremberg. Um, we, have, we, we have all these different packages. The community comes out there. We run them through a process called auto build. Auto build takes it and creates, takes those packages, take, verifies that they're all at consistent levels, gets them to the SUSE code line, runs them through this base process, and, and out shoots something that's for individual uh, platforms Intel 32, Intel 64, so on and so forth. That's all through our auto build process. Then, let me just go quickly to the next one. Then what, we, what we're talking about doing is putting that auto build process online so that end users can use it. So we want IBM or we want anybody to be able to go up and create their own distribution. We're going to put all the packages up there. 
You say, hey, here are the platforms that I'm running on, here's the repositories, here's the libraries, pick and choose what you want. We'll run it through our auto build process, and at the end, you're going to get ISOs. Now, that's, that's phase one. That's in development. That'll be on OpenSUSE. Uh, I'm going to turn into a software guy, Q1 this year. Um, so we're allowing you to create your own P distro geared towards your specific hardware. Never again when you have a problem with, hey, I don't have this, the drivers to this particular one, go up and build them and download it and create the individual ISOs. Now, phase two is say, okay, I've got the ISOs. Now let's load that on a test environment and make sure that it actually runs. So we're building a test environment. We're online. You can say, I've created my P distro. Let me load it on this piece of hardware if we've got the hardware. And we'll let you know which ones are available uh, and run it, see if it works. Don't have to worry about if I've got a compatibility or driver issues because you just ran it on that hardware. Then you can actually take that and download it either virtual or, or create your own ISOs. So we're allowing customers, and we believe that IBM, we don't think that end users are going to do this that often, maybe some. But we, we're allowing IBM, HP, Dell, so on and forth, we believe that they're going to use this to create P distros to eliminate the driver issues that, that, that face a lot of customers today. Yes. We hope that IBM will do what well, Levano will do that for you. So we think that if, if we can, if we get the, the um, and we've got the big four, we've got Fujitsu, Siemens, Dell, IBM, HP. Uh, we're working at, at, the, at, the, at the next tier. Um, and then uh, Intel's pushing us for the white box. We believe that they will, they should be able to create that for you. Because right now the issue is that they want to give the drivers. Oh, yes, yes. It's fully open to everybody. We think, we think that the primary users are going to be the hardware providers, but it, it doesn't preclude anybody from doing it. It won't be. Let's talk. Okay. So every, every, it's going to be open to everybody. We're not putting any, any binds on it, but everybody will have access to it. In our minds, we're thinking that those guys will use it because it's a way that they don't have to give us drivers. They don't have to worry about, hey, well, SUSE Linux shipped in May, and you know what? My hardware dropped in June. Or my hardware dropped in July. Now what do I do with all my users that don't have drivers? Well, I'll, just, I'll put a CD in there. Forget that. Create a new distro, load that distro on your box, and you're done. Okay. So, so we got the P distro and we got the V distro. Going back to the concept. Now let's talk about environment, and, and how, why does that make sense for, for a user? Why, why is that a good thing? Traditional environment, I've got Intel 32, I've got IA64, I've got RISC, and I've got a mainframe. I've also got some type of storage. Well, let's use some virtualization technology, and let's actually, uh, well, first let's install P distros. Remember, I've got a P distro for each one of those. I've got a P distro that's geared toward, and all, it, and all it is is a real thin distribution geared towards that IA64, geared towards that mainframe, everything in between. Now that I've loaded it there, Let's use some virtualization technology, and again, maybe it's Zen, maybe it's the open source version of, of VMware, whatever it may be, um, and let's create virtual machines in those environments as necessary. Again, clustered file system using OCFS, I can do the same thing with storage, but let's focus on the servers at the top. I've got physical servers with a very thin operating system just to get, basically just booting them, booting them and say I'm ready to, to host an app, that's all it does, and I can create a virtual machine. Now. Let's take V distros. We talked about the validated configuration program. Let's just say those are V distros. I created a V distro, a runtime application. I now can place that application anywhere in my environment because I've got a P distro. I don't care about the hardware dependency anymore. I basically made a runtime version where I can put that on a physical server. I can put that on a virtual server. I can move it at runtime. I can move it in the middle of a transaction because I don't care what's happening at the hardware layer. The hardware has been extracted from the problem. I've got a runtime stack, and that stack can be a JBoss, a MySQL, whatever it may be, because I don't care. I know that whatever hardware I put it on, it's going to deal with the storage issues. It's going to deal with all the other issues. It's going to deal with the driver issues, because that's what my P distro does. So again, what we're trying to do is abstract the hardware from the application, give you some flexibility in your environment. It really gets interesting. You say, okay, that's great, Andre. It looks great in a chart. But it really gets interesting when you start adding some other components to it. If you added an enterprise monitoring tool that says, okay, this server traditionally runs at 55%. I know it's got a problem once it gets to 60%. When it gets to 58%, I want you to create, find anywhere in my environment, I don't care what type of uh, box it is, find a box that has a P distro that will support the V distros on, that I'm running, create a new virtual machine, and move that application over and move those users over there at runtime. Workload management, 
policy driven, create my policy saying that, hey, you know what, if this particular box gets, uh, or this particular uh, image server gets, gets pinged more than uh, by 200 users, create a new virtual server and move over and let those, let those uh, users have at it. Or create a new virtual server on a different type of box, but again, I don't care because the application will be portable. So what this gives us is the ability to have a policy-driven adaptive data center, which gives us some functionality that should be extremely powerful to some customers. I no longer have to worry about promotion, production to promotion, production to promotion uh, uh, environments, promotion to production, this probably sounds better, uh, environments where I have development, test, and production. I want a development environment? Great. Created virtual machine and create it. Want to move it to test? That's another virtual machine with the same environment. Production? Another virtual machine, same environment. If I want to spread that out to 20 different people, give them the v-distro, allow them to create the virtual machines, the p-distros are there, give them the v-distro, they can move it wherever they want. I've got uh, compliance issues where I've got to actually uh, take my stack and I've got to archive it. And the government says I've got to have that for, for 18 months, but my production running stack. Well, how can I do that? That production running stack is your v-distro. You take that, you archive that, you need to pull it back out for disaster recovery, you pull that v-distro out, the box isn't running, it's fine. Move it to another box with a virtual machine. So it's really the merging of the physical and virtual worlds. Now, if you look at this, this is what, what our product will be, the Nobel Data Center Manager. What is environmental monitoring, provisioning, workload management, scheduling, and policy in SLA? That's a grid. That's HPC. That's really what an HPC does today. That's what a high-performance computing cluster does today. That's what all that technology is. So, and I said before that 78, I think it was the number, 78 of the top 100 HPCs that are running in, in, in the world are running on Linux. So we have a lot of knowledge of how these things work well and, and what doesn't work well. So we're taking HPC technology, making it a little bit more focused, and then when you add in the P-Distro, V-Distro co combination, it gives us what we think is a very powerful adaptive data center environment. Now, this is something that is... Uh, I'll become a software guy again, and, and probably Q, Q3 this year, early Q4, you'll see released. You'll see parts of this come out as a standalone. So if you just want to have an environmental monitoring tool, that's great. You want to have the great create, uh, online create your own P distros? Well, that comes out Q1. Have one of the ability to just create your V distros? Well, we're going to give you the tools if you just want to create a, a runtime stack and, and do all the testing. You want to create a policy database? You can do that as well. So individual components that all have benefits, but put them together, and we think that we've got a powerful workload management tool. So I've gone over my time, but these, those were the four key areas that we think that we are, are critical to us. It's kind of hard to read them, I think, but for, for open source adoption, really to take it to the next level, to summarize, it's foster innovation in emerging growth areas, uh, spend some money in, the, in areas that we think just may not make sense. As, as, as he told me, take the two by four and smack yourself in the face with it every so often, because Sooner or later, you're going to find some, some areas that you have to go into. Uh, enterprise class support and distribution for uh, open source applications. That's what we call the market start. Mixed sourced. We know that that's the way that we have to get into these environments. And then find a ways that we can get this hardened SLA so that people don't worry about, well, I've got a box from one company, software from another company, an operating system from somebody else, and the drivers don't always work well together. How do we get it so we can get five nines up times? So those are the four key areas that we're focusing on. Um, questions, comments, and apologize for going over a little bit. Yes, sir. No apologies necessary. Uh, this is somewhat reminiscent of the, the, the business about the uh, P distro and the V distro. It's very reminiscent of the abstraction of the uh, code uh, generators yep. and compilers and then uh, two code interpreters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually, I, I would tell you that that's actually um, how I explained it to some of my engineers when, again, I was, I was sitting on a plane, as, as I always do, and, and seem, seemingly, I always tell people I work in an airport near you, um, and, and was, was thinking about how do we do this abstraction. When we, when we got on the phone, when we landed in the airport, started doing some chatting, and we started talking about doing pseudocode. You know, what happens if I got some pseudocode, and what happens if I got P code, and then I run it through? I said, wow, you know what? I could take that. And I can run that through a basic linear compiler, and it's going to add the add libraries, make it for that. And then we got to the point where we thought that the younger guys would understand it and said Visual Basic, where I said I can run a, you know, let's create that, and then I, if, as long as I got that VBB running on, on anywhere, that VBB.lib or whatever it was, uh, I can run my Visual Basic application. So it's, you, you hit exactly on, on how we hit onto that.
Yeah. Well, that, that's what's going to be interesting is that I can imagine an environment where I'll have an application in a mainframe. I'll run an app armor static around. I'll have my intrusion protection, and, I, and I'll make it a v-distro. And maybe I want to run it just through, through, through the virtualization sections on the mainframe. But somebody may be tempted to say, well, you know what? <laughs> it would be really cool. In fact, if you give people the opportunity, somebody will say, you know, I, I, let me put this on this Dell uh, dual-core box and see what happens. And after all the sparks and smoke comes up later, they'll call me up and say, what were you thinking? Well, in our data center manager, in the policy, what we actually do is, as part of that dependency mapping, as part of what uh, AutoBuild does, it actually says, what are the dependencies that are there? And if those dependencies don't exist, that's part of the profile. It says, you only will be able to move to this type of thing if it has those dependencies. So it's not as, you know, I, I made it look very good and, and, and you can move to everywhere. There's going to be some, some, some you know, I'm not going to move to every risk box. I may not be able to. Yes, exactly. All right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big, smart, quiet computer somewhere figuring out, saying, hey, you can, and, and it's to know the dependencies and to know the packages that are there and then know the libraries that are going to exist. As long as we don't have them. We yes. Have them. What, what's the dead package going to come out? That's what's coming out. It, it's a good question. Um, there's a couple of different things that, that yeah. <laughs> couple of different things that we're doing from a development standpoint. We are actually building, and this is regardless of this V distro, P distro, we're actually building, as I said before, the IDE, and we're building um, um, what we're internally calling, just because I couldn't think of a better name, the Novell Application Hosting and Development Platform, which is going to be an operating system. Here's the problem. Um, as I had a two headed side of the world when I was working at Dell, I was responsible for Linux, I was also responsible for, for Unix to Windows migration, so I spent a lot of time in Redmond as well. I just had to make sure I pulled out the right slides when I was going to different places. They spent money. They spent, and there's actually a lot of customers who are doing that. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's basically what it was. It was get off anywhere you can, and, and guess what? We'll 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 do it for you. And once you get there. He was working for Dell. I was working for Dell. I didn't care as long as it went to Intel. Exactly. As long, as long as you run my stuff and, and, and it comes from Austin, I'm happy. But uh, when I went to, to Microsoft, we actually started looking at a traditional Linux environment and Unix environment, and we, we went through all the individual components of the, of the thing. So there's the app server, there's the web server, there's the database. We said, well, what's your equivalent? Well, we've got MySQL, we've got, this other, we've got SQL Server, all these different things. And I said, well, where's your application server? You know, where's your web sphere? And they said, you don't get it. Windows is the application server. We don't sell an operating system, we sell an application server, which is why they put all those individual things in there, because they realize that the, the value in operating system is very thin. Operating systems have, we had, we had one customer, we said, hey, would you migrate from uh, Red Hat to SUSE? We said, we'll do it for free. We'll give you free hardware as well. I said, why would I do that? I'm happy things are running. It's not a really benefit to me. Operating systems are really irrelevant. They want the application layer. Microsoft has been able to position themselves as an application server to these customers and not an operating system. Red Hat, um, SUSE Linux, Debian, whatever, they're operating systems because you still need some other functionality to do something and they don't have, most importantly, the development environment. The .NET framework ships with, with uh, Windows Server. So we're in the process now of taking Mono, taking some other struts and some other stuff that we've, that we've built and we've got um, our, our guys from Zimian, former Zimian acquisition, working on and building that in so that you will be able to buy, if you want to just buy SLES, you can buy SLES and just have the operating system. But if you want to buy the application platform, which includes development environment, which includes .NET, which include access to our Novell developers network, which will include sample code, sample everything, that you'll be able to buy an application package from Novell. And that will be, I'm, I'm going to turn to the software guy again, Q3, Q4 this year. Everything is going to, f going to go right after uh, SUSE Linux 10. You first, and I'll come over here. No, 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 no. Is, is that when they position themselves, they position themselves to cu customers view them as an operating system, as they do us, as opposed to when they view Windows as an application server. The difference is the .NET framework ship with it. So they've got SharePoint services that ship with it. You get an uh, embedded version of the content management server. All ship when you buy the Windows Server 2K4 or 2K3. Um, they all ship. You get, a, you get your, your mom. There's a, a hook for mom that's already in there. So what? Yes. Yes. It's it's mono, 
It's a database. We're ship what we're doing is we're shipping the application platforms as well. We're going to ship a J2E server. We're going to ship an, a, a database. Is this more of a marketing position? No, no. No, we're uh, what is it, eight, eight weeks ago um, from Red Hat where you get the where you get their J2E server, you get uh, MySQL or whatever their stack was. Uh, you get their version of the LAMP stack. What we want to do is something similar. We want to have our base stack, which is going to be a mixed source stack, which will ship with SUSE Linux. So you can use it, have a development environment, have mono. We're going to put an ID in there as well, um, Eclipse and another ID that we're working on. And, Okay. Um, in that Red Hat comes with a database, it comes with a lab stack with it, uh, yeah. as does Debian, as does other... Red Hat made an announcement eight, eight, uh, less than eight weeks ago now, um, about six and a half weeks ago, that they are putting out their own version of a stack. It is a separate product. It is a separate a subscription. It has, it has their directory. It has, uh, it has their directory. It has their... Um, um, uh, their J2E server, uh, Jonas, it has, has um, three or four other components that are in there. It is a separate product that does not, those components, oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and those components do not ship when you buy RHEL 4. You, but to say that it doesn't have, I thought they said something to the fact that they don't have a development environment. No, no, no. What I said was that they're not positioned, and this is not a slam on them. The entire environment, we don't position ourselves <laughs> as a platform. Yes, there's a positioning component, and then there's also the next step of it, which is how are you going to get to that point? We're working with, and there's a couple of different uh, vendors out there now, give you the ability to create your own, as we said, the validated configuration, to create your own stacks. So if you, as a customer, have your own development environment that you want to have, and you, and you don't want to go out to a spike source or a blue glue or somebody and create your own stacks, we're going to be shipping a tool where you can create your own development stacks as well, and then do whatever you want with them. Uh, and again, we're going to give you the basic tools there, then give you a Nobel Developer Network, which is going to be a similar MSDN-like like affair, uh, and give you that environment. So there's positioning, which is just to say, hey, it's here, it's embedded in it, if you want to turn it on, you can, and it's similar to what, what you have for Windows. And then there's the access to create your own stacks, there's the, uh, the mono and the other libraries that we're going to ship and sample code, and then there's Developer's Network and something we're, we're tentatively calling uh, Expert Form, which will give you access where somebody can actually do community-based code between you and Novell. So it's a program that we're putting out. Is part of it positioning? Yes. Now, and, and again, I set it off, this is not anything negative of what Debian or Red Hat's doing. In fact, in certain areas, we're, we're, as Novell, we're playing catch-up to what they're doing. But we didn't want to just put out packages without having all the wrapping around it. So the wrapping being the developer's network, other libraries, uh, an IDE, give them an IDE choice and things of that nature. I'm um, sorry, I was going to you first. Yeah, you, what you've described so far basically amounts to a total ecosystem for um, a business solution um, infrastructure. Yes. Uh, when you get 100% market share, roughly how many customers do you think you'll have? <laughs> I, I, I do not know that answer. Uh, no, no projections yet, but I, I will tell you that... Um, some of our, our, our IHVs, our leading IHVs, uh, hardware vendors, for example, internal at, um, at, at HP, HP's made a decision that they run a good portion of their, of their environment on SUSE Linux internally. Dell, six weeks ago, has decided to make the switch and they internally will run their environment on SUSE Linux, their internal environment. Um, uh, FSC is similar and um, there's, a, there's a smaller player in Europe that's, that's decided to make that as well. Oh, no, 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 we're talking, right now we have, right now, last quarter, Hundreds of millions. yeah, last quarter we had uh, new customers, 6,251 brand new SLES only customers, and that was just brand new, meaning that they, that they bought, and I think that was saying that they bought uh, a certain number of servers and above. So you're a million we think we're, to, we, we think the environmental, the total market for software and open source is around four to six billion. We think the customer base is probably somewhere around, uh, we think it's around 50,000 customers. This is the enterprise level. When you start going a little bit less than that. Uh, enterprise level for us is really, we, we've got a, a formula which, yeah. Our formula is so convoluted that I'm actually not smart enough to figure it out. But it really what it gets to is that, that they have bought, they have bought, they have a certain plat footprint of enterprise products, meaning an SAP, um, a Microsoft or something within their environment already. So it's not the size of customer, it's what they buy. Okay. 
So we, we looked at it a little bit different as opposed to size of customer. Yes. So is I'm trying to get a handle on what the customer base is that you're going to be buying this. Yeah. Are we talking about companies that employ more than five hundred people or we, we more than five hundred, more than a hundred? Yeah. We think for the data center manager, the last part that I talked about. The, uh, the, the wet your whistle part, if, if, if I'm a customer and I've got 15,000 servers, this probably is not going to work for you. I'm going to go to for a Tivoli and, or I'm going to use an Opsware or something like that. But we think our sweet spot for the data center manager are customers who have 20 servers to probably around 2,000, 2,500 servers because they're going to run management in different domains. For our enterprise, for SUSE Linux, you know, we have customers, our, our average server buy from a customer today and this again, this and when I give you that number of customers, that's people who buy support. They, there's so many more customers who are just buying distribution, but those customers who buy support from us doesn't count what people buy from Dell, doesn't count what people buy from HP, because they're gonna, they're getting their support through HP and Dell and so on and so forth. Um, the average number of servers that we sell to customers is only 3.5. So there's a lot of customers that are out there that fall beneath our enterprise radar today. Our average server sale of customers is per server, it's 3.5, 4.5, depending on how you, how you do it. So we think that we're looking at the pyramid and think that that's where the sweet spot for the enterprise is, but we think the rest of it is huge. So our data center manager product, I didn't mention it, will work for if you're running Red Hat, and will work if you're running Solaris. Yes. That filed an IRS tax return that employ more than 500 people. If we scale that out globally, we're talking about 50,000 enterprise class customers in the whole world. Right. It right. seems to me a rather perilous. But that doesn't count edu higher, higher eds and doesn't count small and medium business, which is, no, which is where Nobel Netware. We have significantly more Nobel Netware customers than we do SUSE Linux. We believe if again we believe if you have more than if if it's if you have more than twenty servers if you have more than ten servers realistically and you have a configuration management issue, we believe that that the data center manager makes sense in your environment. So it's not really a size in terms of how many employees you have. It's really how many. Uh, there's some hosting companies on, uh, in California that have hundred 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 people in there, but they're billion dollar companies. They do a lot of hosting, so it's really the number of servers that you have. So that's, we're looking at it, trying to skew the world a little bit differently instead of, let's stop looking at how much revenue you have versus how many people. We care about your servers. We care about managing your individual servers. That's what's important to us. I don't care if you have five people, but if you've got seven servers and you've got a configuration management problem, guess what? This will work. And we're pricing this. Ex almost got ahead of myself. We're pricing this at a reasonable, uh, let's say Opsware and, and Tivoli and CA are uh, 5X. This will be one half x. It's extremely, extremely consumable, uh, and, and we're actually looking at pricing where we're going from. Uh, we have a hosting option right now where we actually uh, private label one of the uh, ones I just mentioned, and we, we do private label per server. We're looking at selling this thing, uh, putting thresholds saying if you're doing less than 20 servers or 20 and more. That's the pricing. We're trying to make it very simple, very low cost to get to the exact customer because that's one of the things that came up. Yes. Is this going to stop the, uh, the head slicing? That's not our major, our biggest problem. Let's talk, no, Novell's biggest problem is that we spend a lot of money, in, and as I said before, our, our primary revenue base is Novell Netware. It's Novell Netware and the maintenance business of Netware. That business declines 10 times faster than we can grow this business. So that's the problem, is that SUSE Linux is not going to be, it's not going to keep the lights on at Novell. It's the SUSE Linux plus one. So what we're doing is that we're putting a lot of efforts into this area. I didn't mention what we're doing with ZLM and Zenworks Linux management and, and our systems man resource management, spending a lot of money there. Our projections for this um, are close to, uh, we're, we're, we're over, we're, we're near $100 million from, from projections that have been verified by, by the analyst. So, but that $100 million is really going to stop, is, is going to match the decline that we're seeing in NetWare. I mean, we're, we're, 
revenues were at $1.2 billion last year. Profitable, we made, we made money last quarter. $1.2 billion is total revenue. That revenue declines as people migrate off of Nobel Netware. That's what really OES is. I said OES, you get Netware, you can put it on SUSE Linux, that keeps in the Nobel family. But the cost of Nobel Netware is much more than the cost of SUSE Linux. So while this is growing, you know, growing extremely fast, our revenues are declining down because it, it takes about six customers to take care of one Nobel Network customer. So having answered the question you didn't ask, I have a tendency to do that. Yes, plus. This this itself will not, but this and some of the other things we have going on. Um, as I said before, we, we use open source as a, as a way to, to, number one, maintain market relevance, let's be honest. It got us in the door after the SUSE acquisition to CIOs that we'd never seen before. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to sell some of the other products. ZenWorks Linux Management, uh, or Identity Management. We're number one in Identity Management, we're number two in Resource Management uh, in terms of those tools that, that work there. So logically, there's three-prong effort, that four-prong effort that we have. It's to maintain our current network base because a lot of customers, especially in, in education, and a lot of HP customers, our primary customers are HP that, that have that because they're, they're, their market share in education, our market share. So it's to maintain that. It's to focus on SUSE Linux as a distribution. It's to focus on what we call above the distribution tools. This is one of them. It's to focus on resource management. It's to focus on identity management. That's where, we're, that's where we're placing our bets. And those are the areas that we have at least 20% market share in each one of those areas, at least. Talk about ZLM and identity. Identity, we're at 80% market share. But it's, it's a nascent market. It's growing. So we're placing, we know that the one, the network, is going to slowly decline. There's always going to be some network guys. There's always going to be some guys who are running SCO. Always going to be. Um, but the, the amount of money that you get, we're hoping those other ones, well, we're placing bets that those other ones go up. Plus, there's another problem I can't talk about that we're, that we're doing. So the answer is yes, but plus. This itself is not going to do everything. It's that plus the other ones. Sorry. <laughs> We, um, let, me, let me give you an example of what happened with, with Zen, XEN, not our ZLM. When XEN first, first came out, it was the greatest thing in the world. It took somebody who had probably six or seven PhDs from Oxford, Harvard, and wherever, Cambridge, to, yeah, to, Cambridge, to, actually, to, to actually install it. It was the hardest thing in the world to install. It was a collection of libraries. There wasn't any wrap around it, and it was not what we called consumable. You could not actually, if, if you were me, and, you know, your whole goal in life was to look good in a suit, you couldn't actually install it on a server. You had to call on the smart guys with the dirty knuckles to actually do it. So we believe that for, for open source to be extremely proliferated, to proliferate everywhere, we've got to make it consumable. We've got to take the science out of it. It's got to be in there, but it's got to get to the point, you know, my father asked me one time, and this, this really shocked me, because my father spells computer was starting off with a K. He can't spell computers. Um, has no concept of that. <laughs> yeah. He actually, he actually called me up one time, and, and I, I had bought him a computer a long time ago, and, and, and it sat there, and it became a paperweight, and there was dust in my old room. Um, and, you know, he had my high school and college diploma and everything else sitting on that. And he called me up one time and says, I just installed Windows, and I want to put on this, and I, I said, oh, I'm sorry, back up again. You just did what? He was able to actually install Windows. I don't know if he would have been able to install a leading Linux on that server the Linux desktop, and not have any issues. To be consumable, we need to make it so that, it's, so that it's, it's replicable, it's packageable, and that my father can install it. That's when we get to the point where it becomes growth, where the growth goes up. Big Macs are consumable. But if you have to go out and kill yes. a cow and bake some bread and all the rest of it, that's not consumable. Right. But didn't you use it in the context of price? Well, that's, that's, that's the second stage. That's the second stage. Yeah. Now, so I'm just to that, that's the second say. Well, trust me, and, and usually in each speech, I make up about four or five words, um, and I, then I try to trademark them later. But but there's yeah exactly. So there, there's two stages. One is to make it as easy as possible. The second is make it as, as, as cheap as possible. Well, not as cheap as possible. To make it readily, it's going to say consumable. To make make it uh, so that so that it takes the decision out of it. 
Yes, it makes the decision out of it. If right, if I go to if I went to a customer, in fact, I, I had this problem. I went to a, I went to a CIO and I said, hey, he said, give me my, my total TCO. And this is when I was at Dell, and and I went and gave him a, a total TCO number. And he says, well, that's too big of a number for me to eat. He says, but I have a threshold of up to here, and my directors have a threshold up to here. And if I can get it to the point, if I can make technology to the point that I can get it to the director can make the decision, not have to go up and get the board level approval to buy something, then I've got something. I can put it into a box and I can sell probably five units of my data center manager and never have to worry about it. Now, Opsware or Tivoli or whatever it may be, that's a CIO level decision. That's going to take some time. And that's not really the volume and scale. It's a different type of business model. We're looking at a volume and scale, which is make it cheap, make it easy to make it a Big Mac from the value menu. I think you had something over there. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I agree. And that's a, and that's a, and that's a different issue. And yeah. the problem with installation right now of a lot of the Linux boots is that it's cheap. So I think it, you need to go sell a little more credit. No, 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 and, and I give us credit from where, from where, from where the industry has come from. Um, and, and you're right. There's two issues. If I'm, if I'm selling, and that's why I started off when I said NLD today. I don't think it sits on an, on an administrator's desk, uh, meaning a, a, a secretary admin's desk. I think it can sit on a developer's desk. I think it can sit on a, uh, a system administrator's desk, and maybe an IT director who's a business guy desk. Uh, but I don't think it sits on the, 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 the baseline executive assistance desk today. I've seen it. No, no. The, the reason is there's a couple issues that for me to be an administrator, an executive assistant, there's a couple things I got to do. I'm creating documents all day. I want those documents to be, I don't want it to have to think about, because I can't think about, because I'm doing similar things about the compatibility of those documents across environments. I may be using some tools and techniques that I've written, some macros that, that, I've, that I've written that I share with people, you know, and especially you see this a lot in Wall Street, which is when you go to Wall Street, they actually have three terminals sitting in front of them. They have a, a Unix terminal, they have a Windows terminal, and then they have a terminal of choice, where their terminal of choice is what they do personally. And it's because they share information they share some macros and share some other things with other people. Now, until we get to the point where we have that, that transfer, and we're not, you know, this is not a, a negative. We're getting to the point where we have that transferability, and again, my word, um, to, to across environments. That's when, that's when you, you get the guys who don't really think about, well, that, don't let me save in an ODP format. Let me save in .doc format. Yeah, I know I can change that and make that to default, but that is, again, another thing that somebody has to think about. So when we... Yes. Uh, yes. Certainly do have. Yes. Um, in that sense, we, we have a number of, of bills to address. Um, the ease of use, the simplicity, the, the appropriate ergonomics. Yes. Studies that actual place take numbers on paper as opposed to stories in the air show that it's possible that people do adapt to it. Assuming you're using very easy, your, your own studies have said. Totally understand. But here's the difference. Two days is too much. Because if I have Windows at home, and I'm, for you and me, it's not. I, I understand that. And I, I, trust me, I, I paid for a lot of those studies, and I know, I know what, what's realistic and what works with the customers and what doesn't. I understand. I, I, I agree with what you're saying. In, in, in reality, where the fallout comes, though, is if I'm an administrator and, and Johnny at home is doing his homework on a PC that's got Windows, and that's where I write my recipes and do my other things, I've got a, an, an internal intrinsic knowledge that I'd like to be able to take to work with me. And that, that's, that's really where it's, it's, I will give you, every argument that they'll give you is totally FUD. You, you could just throw it out and say, and say, wait a minute, give me two seconds to sit with you, and it's the same exact thing. And I, I, did, I did the experiment. I, I put my dad in front of my laptop, and, you know, I booted up uh, NLD, 
And he was able to go, go around and do what he needed to do. He didn't even notice there was a difference because what did he do? He just went to the web and did his, did his you know, wrote an email, well, and he was happy. I mean, they're being a little simplistic. I have several grandchildren who, when they started school, um, and for the first time they encountered them, uh, whatchamacallit, um, the computers that they run, not, not commands, they, another operating system. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I really just couldn't do it. So it's true. It's, it, we need to not spoil people with Linux. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and, no, and, and let's, let's be honest. Our friends in Redmond have never, ever created the best software. Never, ever created. Never, ever created the software that worked the best. Never, ever created the software that customers liked the best. However, they're able to make it consumable, whether it's a, a story or not that people believe that they needed to have it. And that, that's what we don't have today. Yeah, and that's my, that, that was my home, my home argument. Yeah, it was consumable because you got it. I'm buying a computer, and, yeah, and I got the Intel inside, and it came with Windows. Point, point taken. Point taken. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I got like three points. One is. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's one per user. Uh, <laughs> they're related. You've got to pay for I'll take the users <laughs> off. All right. <laughs> Instead of having clearly defined lines between the OS and, and all of these uh, applications and other layers, that there gets commingling going yes. on. And we've seen what happens when, when Microsoft has done that. That's why I want to yeah. make it very clear that what's happening here is a positioning issue and not a technical issue. Well, there are technical issues. I mean, uh, the, the technical issue of, of allowing for integrated management of all of this and the, the, the P and D uh, distros and so forth. There's technology, definitely, but we're not, we, we, there's not the real stack to software and it's great. Right? Um, if you look at Microsoft, what they'll say is they're <coughs> single and you've got
broadly speaking, the United States kind of scares people um, often to go, uh, oh no, we're integrating. And we saw what happened when we integrated, yeah. <coughs> and, and we're going to do it much better. Um, and a lot of what's happening in these, in, in these uh, uh, technologies is not moving away from the units or the Linux way of doing things. Right? It's providing a lot of the sort of polish and whatnot that we didn't think to before. Yes. Last year's conference here, we talked about LDAP. Where the hook the hooks are in there, right? Right. So you want to avoid that. Yeah. And, and I don't right. think that we're headed down that road, yeah. given the different projects that we see. We're seeing um, it's kind of the difference between making things fit well and welding them together. So are you suggesting so, that Nobel is, 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 is fitting things together as well? Welding? No, no. I'm suggesting that Microsoft welds things together. Oh, we all know that. And, that, and, that, and that Nobel and a lot of what's happening on the planet is, is making things fit together better. So we're, we're making things fit, but we may be using the Microsoft story. Yeah, and and, and go, yes, I need that. and and that's, that's that's probably the difference is that yeah. the Microsoft Store we may use some of the same words, but at the end they're still standalone applications that that we, yeah we put some soup so they work well together, but you, they're still standalone. But you're right, the story is what resonates because you know people are lemmings and they, and they they enjoy that story, and the story makes a lot of sense. It does, and it's just a better way of doing it. Right. Right. If we, uh, you know, actually, you know, don't tell the story, then people say, "Well, you're doing it wrong." So, but uh, we'll watch this cycle this is happening. But, yeah. but it's, it's important for the sort of technology to understand that this is a way to tell the story as well as a way to make things work together. But it's not a departure from the traditional um, modularity um, interfaces, you know, open code, yada yada. yada. Okay. If anything, it's a, just an extension of that without without exactly. um, co-op. Yeah, and I think it's an important point that Robin asked earlier when I was talking about the validated configuration. He said, well, what is that? And, you know, I, and the answer was, it's a service offering, which is really telling you that the soup to integrate these things isn't the fact that they're all hooked in together, you can't disjoint and pull one out. It's the fact that we're, we're making them, you know, for this particular customer who may have some things that are unique. We're making it work well together and we're doing that. But it's the integrated story. So I think what you're going to start to see, and you'll see it from, from – uh, North Carolina, you'll see it from Boston and Provo, and you'll see it from other places, is taking the stories that, that, that worked well with Unix and worked well with Microsoft and co-opting those stories to the message that we're putting out. To, and, and quite frankly, it's to combat when you go into, you know, a lot of times that you will go into some of these customers, you'll say Linux, and they have a preconceived notion in their mind. And so if you, if you give it to them the same story, the same consumable story, um, they'll say, okay, I'm over that. Now I don't. Now let's talk talk turkey and get down to the details of it. So a lot of times we're putting, as you, as you mentioned, we're putting a polishy veneer on something. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really polished veneer, but it's not really the same when you get down and, and look at the guts. But the veneer may look the same. Are you, do, you, do you think that you're hiding the, the underlying diversity that, that open source and Linux make make possible? Or? Well, it, 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 I think it goes back to that continuum I had earlier, which is there are certain times where we want to have customers focus on the functionality, yeah. and there are certain times where we want to have them focus on the benefits that they, that they receive from the functionality. And, and sometimes it may depend on the customer. Certain customers, they really, really want to see the guts of what's happening. Show me a kernel. Show me all this stuff. Oh, wow, that's all open. That's great. I can add my own stuff, and, and, and it'll go back up. That's great. Another customer, all they care about is, hey, you know what, that technology you're giving me is giving you this benefit. I can use an Intel server. I can cut down my cost. So I think we need to have the flexibility of having both stories. And, I, and to your point, if we go too far in one way and we, and we lose that story of, of, the, you know, the, of having things stacked on together but they're all standalone, 
then we're, we're going to have a significant problem. But if we don't create the integrated story, we're going to have a significant adoption problem. So I think it's two sides of the same thing. But we're, for, for a while, we're going to have to figure out you know, which, which, which way we're going to go and tell that story both ways. I think it's the same story. It's just a matter of the words that, you know, it's the, it's the flourish that you put around it. Well, and I'll give you an example. A, a large um, uh, financial institution in, in uh, the, the Midwest, they were, in the, in the, they were already deploying um, uh, file and print, and they had decided to get rid of Novell Netware for file and print, and they were going to go to Active Directory and do some other stuff. And we said, hey, you know what? We can give you, and, and they're also doing a Unix migration at the same time. And we didn't want, want to go head to head with them for Microsoft and other stuff because there was this one bastion that was using that where the rest of it was Microsoft. And we said, we don't want to get into a features and functions war with this guy. So we don't want to go down that path. But the, we do want to tell the story of guess what? If you go Linux here, well, just trust us that the file and print's exactly the same. We can integrate with the rest of your forest and trees in, 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 your, in your AD directory for the rest of your environment. But you're creating that base platform that allows you to do your Unix Linux migration and have that same integrated, that integrated view of the world, and you can manage the same one, manage your Microsoft environment and your data center environment using the same tools. So we told that integrated story as opposed to the features and functions story. Another case, we, we may do it differently. So I, I think it makes sense based on the opportunity. Yes, sir. All right. That's, it's an interesting question. We, we ask ourselves that often, and, and, and I think if you asked uh, 10 executives, you'd probably get 12 answers at, at Novell. Um, <laughs> all right, the technology view of the world is that I, I think that uh, operating systems are getting squeezed from the top and from the bottom. Um, we, long term, are not optimistic about being able to generate significant revenues from just the operating system. We've been talking to guys at Oracle where they believe that the database will be the operating system in the future. We've been talking to guys at Intel who believe that you won't need, you won't need an operating system. Neither one of them is right. Um, same, I gave them that same one. I was like, huh? And, and then they give you some nice charts, and, and, and you, for about four or five seconds, you can believe, well, yeah, that, that could happen. And then you think, if pigs fly. Um, <laughs> not seeing any pigs sprout wings, I think the answer is somewhere in between. I think you'll see a lot more functionality um, stored in data containers, whatever they may be, whether it's databases, which is why you see uh, Oracle using Zen. What they want to be is the container engine to control all the objects, um, which traditionally has been something that's been embedded in the operating system, things of that nature. So they're trying to move it up. With VT and with what they're talking about with more memory and putting in PCs, they're trying to get to the point where you have embedded operating systems on a chip. Um, Neither one, I think, is going to be exactly right. We believe that the future for companies such as ours is going to be to provide the open platform. I don't care if it's consumed by the database guy. I don't care if it's consumed by the chip. I don't care if it's consumed by a cell phone or uh, a mini displayer. I do want to be the guy who manages the bits in between those. So there's going to be certain bits and certain packages and things that move around, and that's what we're trying to move to be. So. We think that in five years from now, we probably won't make significant, uh, 10 years from now, significant revenues from the operating system per se. We think it's going to be more the facilitating other people to do things with it, which is that the auto build, which is why that's the first step for allowing people to say, hey, here's the technology, you do what you will with it, and then position ourselves to manage the things that run on top of that environment, whether it's provisioning, whether it's uh, creation, whether it's archiving, whatever it may be, the management of the bits above it is what uh, Ron Osepi, our, our president and COO, likes to say. I want to manage the bits. And if you get to the point, I want to be able to manage the bits, and I don't care if they're bits for, quote, unquote, Solaris or operating system A, operating system B, operating system C, because if it, they become uh, uh, marginalized, it doesn't really matter anymore. I want to manage those bits. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a bit manager, it's, a, it's a, an abstract term, but that, that's really where we're going is to say operating systems enabler, we want to be the enabler that says, okay, now that you've got a platform, I don't care if it's a database or whatever, how do you move something there? How do you make sure it's optimized? We're an infrastructure software company where today the infrastructure we talk about is SUSE Linux and Novell Netware. 
In the future, it will be whatever. But we want to be able to do the manage that. So not true systems management or resource management, but it's, it's managing whatever it may be. And it may be enabling a developer to create your own environment and say, hey, I've got this and I want to run Linux on, on this device or I want to run Linux on a, a, a PC. How do I do that? Well, you can go create your own P distro and guess what? Here's some tools that we've done that work specifically for, the, for this advice. That's where we think we're going. So moving away from the operating system and getting more to management. So Vista is irrelevant? Vista is not irrelevant. Anything that comes out of Redmond is, is never irrelevant. Um, primarily, whether it's features or functions, primarily for the air that it takes out of the room. Um, the, the biggest threat that we see from, from Microsoft um, is not functionality. It's the fact that they can stop a CIO from making a move. And that's really what happens is that, and, 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 and quite frankly, it's a smart play by them. Every, they mentioned a new release. Oh, we got a new hypervisor. Well, guess what? I had Gartner come to me and Zen's irrelevant now. It's like, what are you talking about? They haven't mentioned anything. All they, they just... He, he said, well, Zen, Zen's going to be irrelevant. He, 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 no, no comments. You can talk to six different Gartner analysts and get well, the, the Yeah, sure. What, I'm, what I want to say is somebody at Gartner, one of the analysts came to him from Gartner and said, yeah. Zen is irrelevant. Zen becomes irrelevant now. And I was like, you, what are you Zen, talking you about? Pick that person up by the coat the next day. You go away <laughs> someplace. Else. But it, 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 I actually mistake Gartner's uh, business uh, model for being truthful. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was at the last one in Orlando. Yep. The open source. Yep. One. That's where I've seen you last. Okay. I was there. You know, I promised Mark Driver that I would not a stand up and contradict him in front of people, and b I wouldn't get into food fights with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> since, yeah, since we're recording, I have to stop shaking my head when you said the stupid part. But <laughs> but up until that point, I agree. And, and you don't have to agree, with, you know. But I mean, people who are hidebound, conservative, and are thinking about at home upgrading from Windows ninety five to maybe that latest to ninety eight. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. But I'd say people who are you know um, not here. Yeah. And, and so I look at Gartner as a touchstone of what is totally mainstream. Right. And see, and, but the, the, the issue with that, to the point, is that Microsoft, uh, and, and again, the biggest threat that we see is they take the air out of the room. They take the air out of the room, and they, and they cause people to stop and say, okay, well, maybe I should wait. Let me think about it. Oh, wait, they said it's risky. Well, I don't believe it all, but there's partial knowledge there. And then, then you know, as I said before, um, you can always find an analyst of choice. Not, this is not a Gartner comment. You can always find an analyst of choice to write a position paper for you. We do it. Everybody does it. And you say, oh, guess what? You should wait six months. And, and that's the threat that we see is not features and functions. It, it's, it's taking the air out and having a CIO wait. Oh yeah, I, it's it's a powerful tool. Um, it 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 hurt us a lot when I was at Lotus. It it helped us a lot when I was at Dell. Um, and it's it's a it's a powerful tool if you have if you have credibility and market share begets credibility. Whether it's real or not, it begets credibility. Do you think that given the new licensing that Vista actually will I, I, I actually think that regardless of the licensing, it would succeed. So it's just a no off for people. Yeah. Now, it's a timing issue, though. They don't want to move away. I mean, I guess you're mostly talking about enterprise. Yeah, it's, it's enterprise. It's a, it's a timing issue, though. Because, um, again, you know, most corporate organizations are lemmings. That's right. They're going to wait to see everything test out, and, and it'll be, it won't be 18 months from now. It'll be 19 to 24 months from now. I hate to sound like a Gartner analyst. There's a 2.2 probability uh, of, that people will start to migrate over. 
because what what what's the hammer that you have if you're an, if you're in a project manager? Guess what? I'm stopping support on. I'm stopping support on NT. I'm stopping support on 98. Stopping support. Once that support stops, you gotta move. And you know you, they, you gotta move somewhere. Now that creates an opportunity for us. It's you know I, I believe that and I've I've said this before that Unix Linux migration was a Y2 to K like opportunity. And and I, I we've been yelling at it for a while. It's a Y two K lock opportunity. It has a start and an end. There's only so much. There's only so much, and then at a certain time, you'll you'll get to see it. And I first want to say that what Sun has done recently has been great. If I'm a CIO, they've taken enough air out of the room that I would sit down and have a conversation with them about x86 and about uh, what they're doing from an operating system perspective. If they go out and they buy AMD, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And from making all the software available from a dollar, it. it does enough for me to stop, and that's all you need. Because inertia is to stay on the platform that you're on. And anybody who gives you that inertia and says, wait, it's enough to stop. And that's, that's what we're fighting against. It's not technology. That's why I was talking, I guess, don't give me features and functions all the time, because features and functions have proven for Microsoft, they don't win. It's the story and getting the story and then figuring out, once you get in the store with the story, then give them the features and functions. But it's, it's what Redmond and what uh, Sun, all these people, what they can do, which I'm most scared of is not anything they're doing from a product roadmap, because I think the community can blow that away. It's taking the air out of the distinct community. It's such a disruptive nature that there's an opportunity created, which is why we're, we're going pushing so hard on, on, on Zen and virtualization even though we know that the majority of companies today do not run virtualization in production. We know that it's enough of a, of a disruption where people will get us in, they'll think about it, and they'll do that. We think Vista, which is why we focus NLD at certain users, because we didn't want to have the story have too wide of a, of a broad approach where we get into a customer and they say, oh, it, it's not going to work for Sally. Well, okay, we're not talking about Sally. Let's talk about all your, your 3,000 ATMs that you have out there. Let's talk about how do you manage all those guys. So we think that Vista, we think the end of support, um, we still do think that Unix to Linux in, in certain areas is, a, is, a, uh, is a, uh, a disruptive event, but we think that there are certain disruptive events where we can get in there. Now, I think what the community needs to do is part of the time is that I think we're going to have to bite, bite the bullet and, and maybe, you know, do some things that we didn't, that may, may don't, maybe don't make the best sense from a individual project perspective, but are good from a whole perspective. As you said earlier, I have to now go out to this project and this project and this project and make things. We've got to learn to work better together. We do innovate things extremely quickly, and we do make sure that things are, 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 uh, are ready to go. However, sometimes a little bit less speed and a little bit more uh, uh, performance out of the box up front in version one makes a lot of sense for these enterprise guys. That's what I was getting to. I, I think the role is that, and, and, this, and this was always why I was pausing before I said this. I think the Nobels, um, and let's just throw some other companies out there, the IBMs or the, or the other guys um, need to step up and take a more active management role in certain key projects. And, and active management doesn't mean that we own it, but it may mean that we contribute certain, certain code that we have that we think will make a foundational base, similar like at Hula where we contribute NetMail and iFolder and said, hey, this is a base to start from. And we know this base is foundational and we know it works because we've got it in customers and, and you know, 5,000 customers and they've been running for five years. But give a solid foundational base. And I think it's the community's response to say, well, you know what? Being a developer, for, you know, the, the idea is that I, I can create that, I can build that. And sometimes I think you may just have to say, Yes, that works. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, I probably could augment it and I'll do that, but let's start off from something that is a foundational base to give us that, whether it's real or not, perceived enterprise class ready. And that's, that's one thing that, that, that is a fight today. Once you throw something out there, you get a lot of people who are, who, who are like, well, it comes from Novell or it comes from whoever. You get the non-invented here syndrome. I want to develop. I want to build it. Yes. And school too well. Yes. Um, I, I agree. Yes.
we, we don't feel that we have to own every project. We don't feel that we have to foster every project. Yeah, it's not only a business. Yeah. So it, it's, I guess my question is. We do play favorites, and, and that's, that's, yeah. Fun. That's great. When you have so many resources. And yep. They can sort of, this is good and that's good and that's not. Whatever. It's cool. Um, and then the next level is that you made that decision and some makes their decision and not the other. Exactly. Yep. Um, that's something that a lot of us are actually actively pushing forward. And by a lot of us, I mean people like OSDL and IBM. I'm sure you heard about the, the uh, Blueberry Team Portland yep. that came out last month. You need this? There, and it's, a, it's a fine line to, to walk for us in, in certain areas. Um, there are certain areas that we think strategic are strategic revenue opportunities for the company. And, and, I, and I'm not picking on management or, or something, but there are certain, well, let's, let's say management. There are certain areas that we believe that are strategic revenue opportunities for us and that we must, from a, as you said before, to keep the lights on, um, maybe not be as open as we should in the community. So I, th I think you're going to see, as, as we are a, a proliferator of both open source and private products, there's going to be certain times where I think companies are going to make choices to say, this is an area that I think I need to own. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have certain ones that integrate with that or certain things that with that, but let me give you an example. ZLM, or ZenWorks Linux Management. That is a strategic, it's one of our five strategic bets, or five. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, strategic bets for the company. We're not planning on open sourcing that. Of course, no one expects that. That's not really my question. My question is how do you plan on getting involved with, uh, or what is your current position with all of the existing open source initiatives that you're already involved with? Yep. What, what our goal is, 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 is let, let's, let's uh, is, I'll give you the OCFS and Veritas example earlier. So anytime that we do something, even ZLM uh, or even uh, Novell Desktop Manager, we are still going to put, based on our boards and, and, and the boards that we sit on and based on our, our community and what, we, what was real or not our perceived leadership in open source uh, in the community, and whether it's leadership or not, our ability to change the direction of open source, we do have that. Right or wrong, we have the ability to change, to take the air out of the room in certain, area, in certain areas, uh, just based on the fact that having a billion dollars, you can do a lot of stuff. It's right or wrong, it's just reality. We are never. What, right or wrong, it's just reality? Yeah. It's, I'm, not, I'm not making a value statement on it. I'm just saying that. No, no, no. No, no. What I'm, what I'm saying is what I just said, I'm not making a value statement. That we can take the air out of the room. Never saying that. I'm not saying that what we do is right or wrong. I'm just saying that we have done that. Uh, and you gave the example for Hula. So we, we did take the air out of the room for that. Right or wrong, it happened. Um, if I think the, this is where it comes down to. We're never going to stop supporting open source projects, even if, it's, even if it's an existing project that we're already in that we have a commercial venue. We may, and we have done this in the past, decide that one open source project is more relevant to us than another and we'll put our resources behind that one. So we've, we've done that, and we switch, and we switch horses halfway down, halfway down the path where we've said, you know what, DRDB heartbeat is more important than us, than, than us open sourcing something that we had. We, we were actually taking Novell Cluster Services, and we were going to open source that. And it would have been a 64-way active active cluster, and it would have taken the air out of DRDB heartbeat and, and a lot of other things that are out there. And we said, you know what, 
that doesn't make sense for us, nor for the community, or nor based on the fact that we've got five developers, that's all they do. Let's not do that. So I, a lot of it's going to be one-to-one -one decisions, but there's going to be times, I think, that you will see, based on commercial needs, that we may shift our strategy. The majority of the times, though, as I said before, we've made a firm commitment. Every time we do something commercial, we're going to have one or more open source equivalents. So that's what we, the key to doing that is making enough revenue so we can have those resources. But that is a firm commitment that we have that we will never abandon open source for commercial. We always give a customer an opportunity. And I think the ones that we already support, the ones that already exist, are probably going to be the ones that we will line up behind. It's, it's, it's an individual question, though. Um, you know, are we going to always take be part of uh, this particular project? Today, yes. Tomorrow, maybe not. If, if, if uh, Oracle comes to us, this happens every day. Oracle, IBM, or whatever come to us behind the table or Veritas and say, uh, for example, let's take uh, VMware and their open source and a VSX. They came to us behind the table and said, we want you to be a part of our announcement at Linux World. And we're willing, if you, why won't you guys back off on Zen a little bit? Decided we'll be part of the announcement, but we're not going to back off Zen. And we were part of the announcement, quite frankly, because everybody was there. Yeah, I, I, I think individual basis will depend on the strategy that we have going forward. If it's not a, a, a market area that we're, that we're putting into, and if we don't have resources that we're developing on our own, I think our commitment is going to be to stay where we are. Uh, Katie and Gnome, you know, we made a statement, but we're still working on both. Um, we, we may have picked a favorite, and it's not really a favorite in terms of what gets installed, but it, it's, uh, we're still working on both projects. So our, we have one part of our organization was nothing but foster open source projects. That's all they do. And there's not a revenue goal with them. There's nothing attached. It's just developers get out the community. The problem is I can't say that we're always going to line up behind a particular project because that precludes what we might want to do from the, to keep the lights on. Um, Hula is an example there. As you said, we were involved in some of those other projects, and then we came out with Hula. And that was a strategic decision made by Ron and some other people that this was where we wanted to go. So I, unfortunately, it's, it's a one-off basis. Oh, sorry. Wow, I've had an hour of questions. Sorry. Brian, sorry. we have another appointment after this, don't we? Is it? We do. We've got, uh, got time? I, I just I forgot all about that. <laughs> okay, well, we still got a little bit of time. I, for, I totally forgot. I'm sorry. Good. Sorry. Can, can you, like I said, not a lot of big software developers yep. have these things, some smaller, maybe even size ones. Um, can you envision a way where what you presented here today or potentially something you have presented? Could enhance the ability of software developers and the like to ship software. Yeah. Um, it's like an excellent sort of shipping mechanism. Yeah. Boom, you know, throw it in your snowball box. We are actually um, super secret double probation type of stuff. We're, we're, we're at, on OpenSUSE, we're talking about the V distro or P distro creation process. We're actually talking about a, an opportunity where we will create something called Solution Forge, um, a Novell Solution Forge, where you can create your own vDistro, if you will, or just a component for a vDistro, and have it on Solution Forge. Then there's another process which we're working on where people can create vDistros from, hey, take this, take this part, this project, take this commercial thing that you're working on, take this all, and it's running through kind of a spike source tool to, to make it all integrated. And then we'll host those. Uh, and allow them to be distributed through our solution forge. So that's something that actually next Monday, Tuesday, we're, we're making that decision on what we're doing there. But we're, we're looking at a solution forge portal where there's going to be a, a portion of it we're going to have our validated configurations, the commercial guys we build with HP, a portion of it that we do with Market Start with uh, you know the um, our Market Start partners and, and Groundworks and all those guys. But we think the largest part of it is going to be community run where people say, I've got this particular project that I want to have up here. 
and here's the description, here's how it works, here's the dependencies, all the other stuff, here's what, what the value is. And here, and, and then you could support and, and you know, all the other stuff that can be in there as well. Somebody can subscribe to Solution Forge or subscribe to your software via Solution Forge and use tools to do that. So we're looking at it as a distribution vehicle as well. Not committed, not done yet, but we, we agree with that, that once you get to the point you've got all these individual components and standalone tools, it gets to the point where, well, wait a minute. It'd be great if somebody's got a great idea for them to have the ability to just have that consumed and, and that we don't take the air out of the room by just saying you got to use our stuff. So that gets to your point. We, I don't think we're ever going to be an application provider, but we will be the people to facilitate by moving those bits, you creating your own applications or integrating your applications with uh, Oracle 9 Iraq or MySQL or whatever it may be um, through this solution forge and through the tools that we got, this auto build and this auto stack thing that we're talking about. Not finalized yet, but I can, there is a 2.0 probability that, that, that probably will happen. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I have talked to the sales staff at NovaNet, and they're very happy to port it, but they need a groundswell of people calling. The tech support at NovaNet is very happy to see it run on Linux, and Jeremy White, a code weaver, is as happy to give me all the bits I need to go ahead and emulate it. Yep. But it's nothing more than a web-based app and a little terminal portage, and I would have to think that someone at Novell could have more impact, and we're talking about tens of thousands of seats across yep. the country. Yeah, and, and, and that's something we do today. We, we have a group uh, and called uh, our Partner Enablement Group. So if Novanet is a Novell partner, or if they're not a Novell partner, um, and again, this is just comes from the size of a lot of people used to write uh, um, you know, network add-ins and network tools. So we have a huge solution book and a huge organization that does nothing but talk to third-party tools and say, we want you to port. Okay, you won't port? Well, if it's for what we call an SSO strategic sales opportunity, one of our deals, We'll actually go out and port it, and in certain cases, we'll actually support it for them. Okay, so then but if how it's, do we get you to consider this as a strategic sale? And how do I reach this group? He just walked in the room. Okay. Con contact your local Novell sales rep and look at the opportunity, and he has access to get to our partner enablement group, and he can talk to the, the software. What was the software company? So we're talking Pearson Publishing. Product. Yeah, so he can talk to Pearson, and, 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 and he can find out from, for, he can find out, because we may have had discussions with him. We may have already had discussions with them, and we, we may know their, their long-term plan. But, you know, if, if he's not seeing something that's going to make his number, I mean, he's, he's looking one quarter ahead. True. Is there a way that, you know, you can sort of make sure it goes top, you know, for <laughs> national <laughs> sales Well, No, I'm with you there. Here, here, here's the problem. It comes down to finances. Mm -hmm. to, to support two operating systems, depending, really, regardless of, uh, forget the port, to support two operating systems usually is an average of an, of an extra $2 million per year to support. And again, it depends on the size of the organization. Um, just from how most people do their structures. So it comes down to the fact that that's why he asked, is there a big enough market opportunity? Well, he said to me, if I hear. Yes. Yes, if I hear the, exactly, yeah, if I hear the groundswell, or if you got a big stick. Right. So we use big sticks, and you know we have uh, uh, Merrill Lynch call up somebody and say, "Hey, guess what?" Or Deutsche Bank did this. Deutsche Bank called 38 customers and said, "Guess what? If you're not part of Novell's Validated Configuration Program, you won't sell any more stuff to us." Guess how many calls I got the next day? 38. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the problem is, is as you said before, right now a lot of it is is, is coin operated. And it looks at the at, and says, okay, what's out there from a, a from a a revenue opportunity for us? There is something, I, and I've got to check to see if it is. Um, I'll give you my email for the, for this one off, and then we can figure it out. But I've got to see. I, we published somewhere. Do we have our our? our no, actually, we I know we don't. It's on our internal website. 
We have a list of a lot of IH, third-party IHVs and their current status for what they're supporting and when are they planning to move to SLES and which customers we've talked to who want them to move. And what you do is you say you put all these together and you call them up and say, okay, guess what, you guys? I got the you know state of Hawaii's people. I got Indiana. I got Novell Internal. Wants you to do it, and boom, boom, boom. Wants you to port, and then that makes a lot of sense for these guys. I don't believe that's on our on Novell.com. I think that's on our internal intranet. Um, I'm, send me an email. Uh, it's email is extremely easy. A Hill at Novell. Um, in fact, you've already sent me one, and and uh, I will hook you up with the guy who runs our partner enablement group. But I, I've got to figure out. I I don't know if there's an external process. I. Or they call, or we just gather the list and say, hey, we've talked to, boom, here's 15 different customers we talked to. I don't know, you know, and again, I know, you know, because I've done this for a lot of customers in the last year, year plus, um, apply pressure. But I don't know if there's, if it's not from one of our opportunities, how that happens. Okay. Well, I, and I'm just, being, I just confess ignorance on our, on our process there. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, and and I I agree, and that's that's. Yeah, I'm with you, I, I, and, and I'm with you, and, and there's some certain issues. That's why with the one-to-one -one in Indiana, it's a very locked-down stack because of exactly that. But the, the, it, it, it goes to right now, I think a lot of it is coin-operated as opposed to being community-driven. And I think the solution forge will get us to the point where customer, for, for community-developed applications, if you will, and for small company-developed applications, what we, do, what we don't have is the reverse. How do you tell somebody there's a market opportunity here? To, we don't have that unless it's coin operated right now. And we say, okay, we've got 15, 1,500 desktops at, at Procter & Gamble that right? you're going to lose if you do this. Um, and and I, I, we, that, that's a good point. Send me an email and let me figure that out. Cause, Yeah. And, and, and then, and then uh, you know, if they're interested, you know, what, what we've done through our YES certification and then YES Ready um, type of enablement is allow these guys to get a quick and dirty view of what it would take for them to do the port. Um, oh, that's, yeah. How, how, give, give me a, send, send me an email. I don't, I don't want to solve a problem. Send, send me an email. I have a tendency to solve problems, which is why my girlfriend hates me. <laughs> I just wanted to talk. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but the game's on. Come on, the Terps are playing. Although, although, although I've got her now. I, I've yet to get her to go to a football game, but I've got her to the point now. I, I took her to a tour, going out for a long time. I took her to a baseball game. And the first baseball game we went to, I, I said, okay, I'm going to get her food. I'm going to get her books and stuff, and then, you know, I'm in the third inning or something. I'm watching my Orioles up in Camden Yards, and she turns to me because I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, 
Cal's coming up. What do you, you know? We, <laughs> so I, I've got her the point out. She actually likes going to baseball games as long as it's a nice stadium and it's outside. And it's a nice day, and I'll get her. And she won't go to an NBA game, which I'm not the big. But she'll go to a Maryland Terrapins game, and she actually will follow the Terps, but can't get her to a football game. So that's. It, but it's to the point that anything. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. She hasn't got me to a fashion show. That, that's what she does. She models in New York, and, and she goes, oh, I'm doing the show. And there's no way I'm going to a fashion show. I'm just, it's just not. She goes, oh, but there's so much music and lights and, and people walking. I was like, that's ah, not, not interesting. I, yeah, but my girlfriend would be one of them, and, and it would be hard to be like, yeah, she'd be walking this way, and my eyes would be going this way. So it wouldn't work. <laughs> So, I, so I, I've avoided that like the plague, and I've been pretty good on that. But the, it's pretty much through the other day. The Redskins were in the playoff, and my, my brother's friend had some tickets. And he was like, oh, hey, we, if you want to go to Tampa, we can go. And, go. And, I was, and I was thinking, well, you know, Tampa, there's a beach. And this is the key. If I was used to, there's a beach, and, you know, there's a spa. Spa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Then I was like, hey, you know, there's a football game, too. Not going to happen. All right, all right, thanks. But I digress, all right. Yeah, she's not a big shopper, which is a good thing. She's a she's a big spa thing. Spa spa's what gets her. Okay. Ooh. Well, let me give you guys my my card. I got a, a gang of cards. I think I appreciate the time. Sorry to go over and long winded, but such is my life. Um, but feel free. A Hill at Nobel. It's the easiest email in the world, except for A at Nobel, I guess. Um, and just send me an email. I. I definitely want to hear about that opportunity. Definitely want to hear more specifics about certain issues, and maybe I can hook you up with a Marcus or somebody else on the open source side to, to talk about community and then talk about this partner stuff, because I don't know if we have that. I, I agree that that's a... We are, we're paving the way for so much opportunity yeah. that I'd love to share. So let me go get a gang of cards, and I'll leave them right